of education will come to order at this time. Is there a motion to enter into executive session? I move to enter into executive session to discuss personnel, collective bargaining, or legal property acquisition issues, and student issues. Maryland Local Government Code Article Section 9-512A, 1, 2, 6, and 10. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second it. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any <coughs> one opposed? The ayes have it. The board will now enter into executive session. And Happy New Year to everybody. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Happy New Year. Absolutely. Oh, Happy New Year. That's right. <clears throat> the Board of Education will reconvene at this time. Please stand for the presentation of colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. Chopticon High School, thank you very, very much. Welcome. Uh, we apologize for starting the meeting a little late, but the executive session uh, just ran over a little bit. Uh, apologize for that. Please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done so already. We want to wish everyone a happy new year. We're in a new year, 2014. I uh, hope everyone has had great holidays and uh, has had fun over the uh, holiday break and <clears throat> is ready for an exciting year ahead of us. <laughs> I'd like to make some introductions this morning. Morning, Anna Laughlin, President of the Education Association of St. Mary's County. Anna, how are you this morning? Nice to see you. <clears throat> Liz Purcell Leskinen, Maryland State Education Association, UNICERV Director. How are you? We also have this morning, uh, with us this morning, Meg McDonald, MSEA, UNICERV Director, 
uh, also. Thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, we also have Faith Abernathy. Faith, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Uh, Faith is the president of the Collective Education Association of St. Mary's County. Uh, who have I missed? Oh, nobody. <laughs> okay. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Right. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Board reports. <laughs> Peter, we'll start with you this morning. Okay. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe that actually the first semester of school is coming to an end um, next week on January the 16th. Um, the year's going by very fast so far and uh, requires you to be fast to keep up with it. Um, with that, I just want to talk about some things that occurred over the um, past month. Uh, breakfast with Santa that happened at the James A. Forrest Career Technology Center on December 14th. I was actually volunteering at, at the event. We had hundreds of uh, county members um, with their children and their families attend for the breakfast uh, with pictures with Santa and family workshop activities like arts and crafts and crafts and games, stuff like that to uh, keep the uh, families entertained through the holidays. I know earlier, uh, a couple months ago, Dr. Monroe asked me to talk about some of the technology initiatives and things that we had installed in the school systems mm -hmm. with the laptops and the internet connections and things like that that we have in place. And I want to talk about an experience that I had in one of my own classes, nice. FOT, um, mm -hmm. Foundation Technology class one day. We took a day out of regular classroom instructions and talked about our digital footprint mm -hmm. and our, our online responsibilities and resources that are provided to Excellent. us by, by the school system and um, from the internet. We watched a video and did an activity about a responsibility on social networking, which um, can result in employers looking at your social net net networking sites and your pages, and that can prevent you from going and getting a job or going and getting into college, uh, depending on what you have on your site. So there is a lot of responsibility with having social networking pages. We also talked about online databases and resources that are easily accessible through the school system, um, such as SIRS knowledge base that we have that just provide different resources for students to use that um, some students don't know about. So it's a lot better than just going and do, doing a Google search about different topics for your, your research papers or your activities that you're doing when we have um, things like SIRS knowledge base on that links from the school's website that we can uh, look at. Also, the school also provides things like Moodle that help with um, classroom instruction that where students can go and look at their teachers' um, assignments and tests and when things are due when they're not in school. So you can go on Moodle and check. We went over things like that. And also, something a new feature with our uh, school system, uh, the student Gmail accounts and Google Drive accounts that a numerous amount of students didn't really know about until we had this presentation. And a lot of students didn't even know how to use the Google Drive system and the Gmail system that pairs them together before the school even introduced them. So we learned a fair bit about um, things like digital responsibility and our footprint and uh, new technologies in our schools. So we, uh, we have the technology and we know how to use it too. And that's, that's the main importance with spending a lot of the money beginning laptops into the school. So going into this new age of, I shouldn't really say new, but technology and being able to use it in the workforce, now we know how to use it as well. And that's a very big part of uh, modern day education, to be college and career ready. Every week I like to talk about uh, uh, my bullying initiative to go and try to stop bullying that's happening um, worldwide and in the county as well. And this week I wanted to talk about a bigger initiative that's been out and that's very well supported. Um, it's called Stop Bullying, Speak Up Initiative. It is um, partnered and sponsored by companies such as CNN, Time Magazine, and Sports Illustrated, uh, Cartoon Network as well. And this, you know, this initiative um, helps to stop and prevent bullying uh, nationwide. Uh, and they encourage their supporters to pledge to do what they can do to stop bullying that occurs around them. This pledge is for students and adults and it asks for people to speak up, advocate, and be a role model for others. 
you can go to uh, Speak Up Bullying. They have a page on Facebook that's very popular. And in fact, they have almost 150,000 pledges worldwide. And they also very much encourage you to not only pledge, but to also share your experience uh, with others uh, using that through Facebook or other social networking to spread it around. So it's not just you who's benefiting, it's your whole community. And I would very much encourage anyone um, who either has a Facebook page or even if you don't, you can still go on their uh, own website and go ahead and look at, just look at the pledge for students and adults. And it asks adults not to just only speak up, advocate, and be a role model for other uh, students, but it also asks if, for the adults to be a partner with the school systems and with their uh, local community to help uh, stop the spread of bullying, which is a very important part of the whole initiative, is for everyone to be involved so it can happen a lot faster. Bullying's been around for a very long time, it's not gonna be going anywhere. Right. So if we want this to end, which the community does, we have to step forward and take a step to stop it. And I believe this is a very great tool uh, that's already being used nationwide to help. And in Maryland, we're one of the, they actually have a map of the entire nation and where the pledges are. And in Maryland, we're actually one, uh, one of the lowest states with only a couple thousand um, pledges. Hmm. And what I would like to see is if we could get maybe a school-wide, system-wide thing where we might be able to pledge um, not just the students, but also the adults and the community members to pledge and to step up and say, I want to help stop bullying in my community. Right. Uh, Peter, let me add two cents. Uh, Mr. Wyant, I see you here in the audience. We've, uh, we've established some pledges when we initially kicked off our anti-bullying programs, our cyber bullying programs. I think it would be nice for the two of you to connect uh, to see exactly what this is, to provide that inf source of information to Mr. Wyant, who's on the cutting edge of all of this in terms of prevention. And I think that's a wonderful way to continue to keep this reinvigorated in the school Definitely. system. And then the other part, too, I just want to commend you on your conversation about the digital footprint, bringing that forward and the importance of that. Who was your teacher who did that? It was actually Miss, Miss O'Donnell um, that works at our school. She's one of, uh, she works in the library as well as, uh, she believes she should be a teacher as well. And she came in and with our laptops that we had in class, and we all actually had a laptop and were able to follow her um, on Google Drive with the assignments that she put up, and we were able to just go ahead and put it on our computer and watch too. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to go back and commend her for bringing that forward and how impressed I was that you did this today. Let her know how pleased I am, and then to work with your principal, uh, Mr. Bowling, to advance that throughout the whole, mm -hmm. the whole school. I think that that's extremely important. And Mr. Smith, wherever you are, uh, make certain that, that that conversation is occurring in all of our high schools uh, at that level because this is a piece that our young people don't always think about uh, that gets them in trouble down the road as you're posting all of your friends and all of yes. your uh, what I define as not always appropriate comments and pictures on the internet those things create a digital footprint somewhere and somehow that will come back at some point to possibly haunt you as, as I speak for our school system we do a very judicious background check uh, in terms of our due diligence uh, we check Facebook accounts we check a variety of different things and those things do emerge and hiring decisions can be based upon that uh, information in terms of being accepted into the military government positions all those background checks play into that so young people don't think when they are out there doing some things on the internet that can cause them problems down the road. They're just not thinking long term. So I want to make certain we educate that as well. So thank you for bringing that up in the new year. Thank you, Peter. Mrs. Crosby. I am the alternate to go up to the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Dr. Raspa is the a rep official person that does it, and I go up when he can't. He's been very good about going up while I've been laid up with my cane, so now I'm trying to make up for missing. But um, I kind of really enjoy it. Uh, you meet board members from other counties. You meet members of the Maryland State Department of Education. You meet superintendents, as Dr. Martirano knows, from Fazam. And uh, we discuss different items. I just want to tell you a little bit about this because it's been going on for a long time. Um, Mrs. Allen is a former president, and aren't you on the board now, mm -hmm. the board? And so she knows the importance 
of Maine, and it's very important as far as a lobbying group goes. Uh, matter of fact, this month, the next meeting, I think is January 29th, we're going to go up as a group. We take the uh, white van, I believe, and we get to meet with our legislators. That's how important this is. I, I hope we can all go. Um, I can. All right, the mission. The mission is to provide members with a strong collective voice, because you know how it is. The more people you can get speaking the same tune, the more likely it is you'll get action. Um, uh, through professional development, advocacy, and member services. I've taken several courses. I know most of us have, so I can't say enough good things about it. I think it's excellent. All right, I went through this. This was prepared by John Willems, who's the, uh, I want to say, legal, uh, legal director. Government uh, governmental governmental relations director mm -hmm. and I went through it because I don't want to it take me all day to go through the whole thing just some things that stuck out at me state funding and FY 215 what is it going to be direct state aid is going to be 5.29 billion dollars so maybe St. Mary's County will be able to get some of that. I don't know. Dr. Marano mm -hmm. will tell us when mm -hmm. that happens. I hope it happens. That is 88.8 .8 million more than FY 2014. I think that's great. Um, then the other thing that stuck out in my mind was they had a big discussion about recurring and non-recurring cost in education. Uh, recurring are things you got to buy every year. Non-recurring, will you buy them once? At, well, hopefully. And then that should be it. Okay, I want to just go over funding needs for education that they have on the docket. Staffing, salaries, and benefits. And naturally, we, don't, we want all those things to increase. Professional development, OPEB, those are post-employment uh, benefits. We've explained it over and over again. Uh, new schools and facility maintenance. Well, we're going to be having some new schools pretty soon. At least one new school that we have a picture of here on our new budget with us in our shovels. Um, educational technology and virtual learning. Which, you know, if you listen, we're really at the forefront of a lot of these things. Pre-kindergarten is now a big initiative. Uh, we wrote a letter. I remember that letter as a group. Oh, my. 2008. And sent it up to the Maryland State Board of Education, and we all signed it. I guess you remember that. So now that's really become, uh, it's more at the forefront, so I guess we were ahead of our time. Compulsory, compulsory attendance age increase. Hallelujah. I don't know how many of you feel that, but it's going to increase. Uh, student discipline and alternative education and colleges, college ready, readiness and dual enrollment. And that's pretty much what the initiatives are for now. So if you have any questions, you can come to me or come to Sal, come to Kathy, and Mary's been up there, come to Brooke. Go to Dr. Martirano and Peter. He'll know everything because we'll tell him. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Crosby. <clears throat> Mr. Matthews. Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, I have a new father-daughter tradition that I'm on my third year with, and it's been enjoying the James A. Forrest Career and Technology Center um, breakfast with Santa. And I tell you, just, Maddie looks, my daughter looks so forward to going to this every year, and we have <laughs> such a good time. Um, I always have to brag a little bit. Um, I'm still picking sp sprinkles and stuff out of the seats of my car because all the crafts that she made and every craft that she made had sprinkles with it. So we, we had a fantastic time. We look forward to it. Um, we look forward to it every year. The poor thing... When she's 25 and I'm still dragging her to it to sit on Santa's lap, she may have issues. <laughs> but it was an absolutely fabulous time, and hey, Peter, it was good to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Mrs. Washington. Good morning, everyone. I spent my time with family and friends enjoying the holiday. 
I use my time to reflect on the previous year and to count and not take for granted my many blessings as a family member, Board of Education member, and a citizen of the United States of America. I look forward with great expectation to 2014 and the challenges we will face and the collaboration, teamwork, and partnering to meet the needs of a growing school system. I wish everyone a new year with abundant love, joy, and prosperity. God bless you and continue to keep us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. <clears throat> Mrs. Allen. I too attended breakfast with Santa. It is always fun. Um, Mr. Kramer uh, in the uh, room here is the um, director of uh, college and career readiness and uh, in charge of the Forest Center. Um, had an opportunity to meet the new chef who um, has come in uh, after uh, Mr. Groshi retired. Um, and uh, the, the students did just a, a wonderful job. The, the school was decorated beautifully, and um, it was clear that uh, the community members who were there um, were having a wonderful time. I was able to see Mrs. Crosby, who was there with two of her grandchildren, as well as Mr. Mattingly with, or Mr. Mattingly, Mr. Matthews with his daughter. Um, it was, uh, we all had a, a great time, truly. Um, I, I would just in closing like to piggyback on something that um, Peter talked about with respect to the bullying and, um, and working to get folks on board. Um, I would um, make this suggestion, Dr. Monterano, mm -hmm. that not only in having conversation with Mr. Wyant, but um, I know that the College of Southern Maryland has, um, is, has been working to try to get the Choose Civility Absolutely. campaign off the ground that um, is, is widespread throughout Howard County mm -hmm. um, and, and has done a lot. And um, I would encourage you to perhaps look at that as well and for us to see if we can maybe be a part of that conversation. Um, I think in my experience, it's, it's not simply the idea of bullying. Um, it's we need to change the conversation about the way we each treat each other and and make those personal connections and um, and really educate and change the mindset of people remind them of the importance of common courtesies and respect and responsibility and and civility overall um, you need only to drive down the road and see the road rage that goes on to realize that um, we all need to take a step back and be reflective. There's somebody out there right now, um, if you've been watching the news, that shot a man, mm -hmm. and they are warning all of us right. about that person. In, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So um, Pennsylvania, I, I, would, right. I would suggest that we look at yep. maybe pulling that in as a piece as well. And I can inform you that uh, Dr. Lacey is a representative working with that group mm -hmm. right now, and when they're getting that with more momentum, we will bring that forward to the board. So we'll triangulate and get all those together. I Very appreciate good. that. Very good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I echo a happy new year to everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Uh, once again, happy new year, everyone. Uh, I like everyone else. Uh, enjoyed the holidays with family and friends and uh, had some great dinners and watched the ball come down and had some champagne <laughs> watching it come down. Uh, and I'm sure those of you that don't, don't drink champagne had a little soda maybe. So. <laughs> uh, in any event, uh, looking forward to a, a great year as we move along. Obviously it's going to be a very busy year. Uh, we will have a budget work session this afternoon and uh, that's going yeah. to be the beginning. Uh, I know the staff has been working diligently to uh, get the preparation ready for uh, the work session this afternoon uh, after this meeting and then we will proceed and like we always do it just it's an unending process as we all know we're in it every day and uh, I hope everyone in this room uh, keeps up with what we're doing and uh, helps us along when we need to help 
because always remember we don't manufacture money we have to go ask for it and uh, that's always an interesting process as some of you know because some of you have been involved in this <laughs> so in any event uh, let's keep smiling let's be optimistic and do what we're supposed to do and uh, we want the best for our children and we want the best for our schools because when we have great schools and our children are learning and we are a number one school system in a number one state uh, then that will help and is helping and will continue to help the community because our community is really growing and uh, we want the best for everybody in St. Mary's County. So, Thank you very much. Dr. Moderano, uh, Superintendent's report, it's your okay. turn. Hey, I'm looking at the clock. I'm trying to figure out how much time I have uh, today oh, because yes. I have. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year. Some things never change uh, in the sense that it's been a while since we've met. Uh, welcome back to the new year. 2014 is upon us. Uh, Peter, it's interesting that you acknowledge the fact that it's the end of the first semester coming up upon us as well. And things will take off very rapidly as several high school principals are here and several high school students are here several seniors as we move to the graduation date. Lots of work that will have to occur. And as I always use the Robert Frost quote all the time, miles to go before we sleep. Uh, we've got lots of work to do between now and to that time frame. So again, welcome back. And I want to bring us to sort of the, uh, the timely information. As we notice, the temperature is very cold today. Uh, it's supposed to reach a balmy high 20s to th low 30s today, which is great. It's a heat wave. Some of my colleagues were in a meeting with me yesterday in Annapolis uh, from Garrett County and as they came from Garrett County where it was wind chill factors of minus 20 to minus 30 uh, they came down to this area and said they felt like they were in Florida so it's all in, it's all relative in comparison uh, in that sense but I do want to remind the community that how we go about our decision making uh, there is a real process for how we go about making decisions to close schools and uh, we build those five days into the calendar, those inclement weather days. I know the young people uh, sitting in front of us are uh, tweeting out to me on a regular basis uh, to encourage the closing of schools. But no, if we go beyond those five days, be careful what you wish for because we have to make those up. Mm -hmm. So those who are following along uh, at home and in the audience, uh, build those five days in. We have used two inclement weather days thus far. Uh, the one most recently, we came back from winter break and then had the storm on Friday, and then had an early, the early dismissal days allow us to count as far as days. Those don't actually count against us in that sense, uh, <laughs> the late arrivals, I should say. So we've used two, we have three left in that sense. Hope we don't have to expend those, but the winter is still relatively young in that sense. We did have to close Leonardtown High School yesterday, and it was a very, I'm gonna say a very good decision yesterday to do the two hour delay. Uh, people asked, you know, what, what went into that decision making? And quite frankly, uh, the decision making was very clear that I wanted the sun to come up. I wanted to, if there was going to be any attempt to warm things up, but most importantly, to allow us the time uh, to make certain that our buses were all going to be running, that if we were going to encounter any problems, that we would be able to have time to mitigate that and make other decisions, and then to give our young people the opportunity to be able to, to move with the daylight as well. I get very concerned about the traveling that occurs during the dark hours. And our buses start rolling as early as 5.30, as you know, and our first bus stop uh, pickups become anywhere between 6.15 and 6.30, and it's still dark in the morning. So a good decision there yesterday in the sense that then it did reveal that we had a water main break at Leonardtown, and then as, as board members, as you know, we came back and closed Leonardtown High School uh, because we had an underground water main break that fed our sprinkler system, and we didn't know what we were encountering at that point. We needed to do the repair to dig the underground, et cetera. Water was flowing outside of the building, and uh, we needed all the flexibility to address that. I am pleased to announce that that has been corrected. School is back in full session today, and our maintenance staff and everybody addressed that and within a very quick time frame. But I always want to remind people how we make that decision, uh, how those uh, decisions uh, get played out, and then I have to report all this information to the state because we are bound by law that young people need to attend school 180 days. Uh, there's a certain number of seat hours that our, our high schoolers and middle schoolers and elementary uh, students have to comply with. And I monitor not only the seat hours, but days, and then we'll adjust the calendar accordingly. But for those, again, uh, for the board members as well as for our parents and audience members, uh, to date we have used two. Uh, we have three left. That doesn't cause any major adjustments for calendar. I had an email from a parent uh, 
last night that I have to respond to today uh, to make certain we did not cut any days from spring break because plans had already been made in that sense. So uh, I understand that, uh, all of that, but we still have an additional three days to work with in the event that we have those days. So students, please try not to wear your pajamas inside out too many more days. Uh, the, the novelty is wearing off already, so I just want to let you know that uh, in that sense. And then as you're thinking and you're, and you're comfortable in your bed and your pajamas inside out and your pillowcases upside down and everything else that you do, uh, know that we're up at 3.30, uh, 4 o'clock, riding the roads and making decisions and checking all of that because we try to make those decisions uh, by 5 o'clock uh, at the absolute latest, 5.30 kind of starts pushing it for us. So let me continue, board members. I want to contend again the sort of the altruistic nature of our student body, and that's going to be represented here today. Started off with our Chopticon representatives uh, from ROTC being present. Always like to have students at the board. A wonderful presentation from our student board member. You do such a good job, Peter. And let me acknowledge that on behalf of all the students. Uh, you represent our student body so well. And I always challenge you to the highest level, and you always come forward uh, with that information. So thank you for that. just makes me proud. Thank you. Esperanza Middle School, another opportunity to talk about how proud I am of our staff and students. Esperanza Middle School and staff uh, and students held a used toy drive, uh, which the school has been running for the past 17 years since Jim Hollis, a retired teacher, and uh, Mrs. Schubrock uh, of the Mount Zion uh, Church saw a need among children in Lexington Park area. Each and every year, Esperanza Middle School students and parents wholeheartedly donate many gently used toys to over 300 needy children. And this year's donation totally filled seven vans and trucks. And I want to commend the staff and students at Esperanza for, again, this, again, constant caring and giving nature of which we continue to feed in our, organ, in our school system. And as I always talk about, the importance of academic achievement is a very important value of our school system, the most important thing that we do. But we're promoting great character in terms of the individuals of which uh, are in our school system as well. And this, again, em em emblem is emblematic of that kind of emphasis. I had another opportunity, board members, and you've heard me talk about this, and there was an article in one of our local newspapers about this. Uh, I met with several of our college students who are in college right now uh, that I invited back for a conversation about college and career ready. And the premise was, did we meet the mark? Did we make the, meet the mark in terms of preparation as far as qualitative information? You may have been prepared based upon your grades and SATs, but once you got there, uh, how did that actually work for you? And it was a phenomenal conversation uh, with these young people. We had a total of uh, nine females and six males, uh, former students of ours. We had representatives, five from Chopticon, four from uh, Leonardtown, three from Great Mills, and three from the Fairlead Academy. And the conversations uh, ranged from a variety of different topical areas. These young people are attending the College of Southern Maryland, Towson, Delaware State University, Carnegie Mellon, Flagler College, University of Maryland, the University of Rochester, the University of Missouri, uh, the University of Florida, the United States Naval Academy, and Elon University. This was a representative sample of individuals of which we had in attendance. And the majors range from a variety of different uh, outlooks. But I just want to pick a couple summary points to say, are we hitting the mark? Uh, in the sense that they talked about key points of the advanced placement classes were most valuable and mirror expectations of college classes. They felt they were ready as a result of taking those courses. They also talked about the dual enrollment courses that we've talked greatly about with the College of Southern Maryland and how that opened up opportunities. The instructional program overall prepared students for expectation of college work and then the college prep classes helped place in higher level courses in terms of math. They talked about study habits and time management as being key, and the more you are involved in multiple activities, the better you will be prepared for college, because they were talking about that overuse trait comment about uh, multitasking, and the, those who do, do more, and having to balance your time when you have a variety of things on your plate. They talked about recommendations as well, so this was not just tell us all the great things we're doing, I try to tease out how can we improve further. And they gave us some recommendations uh, to promote further the awareness of the college access program, how they felt the importance of that, how the, uh, the, the number of students who talked about that maybe college wasn't an option for them, they didn't have the knowledge about it from their own families, but through the college access program, that was something that really highlighted their interest and piqued their curiosity. I know, Peter, you've talked about that as well to me. Uh, promote and advertise the benefits and payments for the AP courses in those in terms of economic need and we talked about how we've incentivized that if you get a three we do the reimbursement and how they were very supportive of that 
because they felt like that translation truly translated to college. They also acknowledged sort of the, the, the dirty little secret there is that as more students have become more proficient in terms of performance on AP exams, that more and more colleges are raising the standard that it's not a three anymore that's accepted to advance out of that course, that they're advancing that to fours and fives. And they felt a little bit concerned about that, that that's not necessarily fair. And, and I appreciate that comment. But the good news is that overall I walked away with a very positive sense that this representative sample, now again, a small group of individuals, and it's hard to get to know where these folk are because we don't have a data tracking system right now that tells us where our students are once they graduate from college. But we did this through a variety of work with our principals to get a group back, and I was very pleased. So I hope that our young people here are tuning into those comments uh, as well because the, the work that's occurring in the St. Mary's County Public School System is truly preparing young people for careers in college, and I was very affirmed by that, knowing we have to tweak some things. I guess the final comment was there was a great amount of conversation about uh, counseling of students in terms of preparing for college that they felt as if uh, we were pushing a lot of the in-state schools. And we, I explained to them the fact of the balancing of economics. That became a major conversation. The cost of college, a uh, two-year college versus a four-year college, and an out-of-state college versus private. And I constantly talk about managing the economics of that process. And so they felt that maybe that we should also look at the whole continuum and really illuminate financial aid opportunities. But a tremendous opportunity, and I was delighted to have that right before the winter break. Let me continue through, please, if I could. Um, the Leonardtown High School National Honor Society, again, in the, the aspect of altruism. Um, Leonardtown High School National Honor Society recently donated $400 to the St. Mary's County Public Schools Shoe Fund. To date, we have purchased 415 pairs of shoes that have been purchased for students in need in this school year. Um, and we're going to have another wonderful interaction here. Uh, as you can tell, I've got a group of students who are just waiting to come over here to talk with me. And but before I do that and have them come over, I also want to let you know something very important to us all is that I've talked about the CIP process very clearly. The Interagency of Schools Committee met on December 20th and approved the recommendation for 75% of the pro proposed capital budget for FY 2015. As a result of our appeal of our three projects, St. Mary's County has now received an additional $5.3 million uh, in state funding in the second round of funding. This cr increases our overall state funding share for FY 2000, 2015 to 54%, and then all of you will be invited, as you have been already, we're just waiting on the particular time to go before the Board of Public Works uh, to advocate for the rest of the funding for the Captain Walter Francis Duke Elementary School as well as the um, Spring Ridge Middle School renovation. So that is moving along at a very timely manner. The second round has revealed another set of money. Mr. Clements continues to, to monitor in terms of the importance of the expression cash flow uh, to manage those projects. And again, I know it's redundant and I need to say it until people get tired of hearing, I'm going to say it over and over. The commissioners giving the, the providing that $10 million up front allows for both of these projects to advance simultaneously because overall those two projects add up to over $50 million. And if we didn't have those acknowledgement that $10 million from this current board, we would not be in a position to advance this project simultaneously with the new school. So board members, I, I've got a couple other things I need to finish with, but I want to express my great gratitude that I'm surrounded today, extra excited today. Every time I have students at the board meeting, I get extra excited. And I've got some wonderful young people here today uh, from Great Mills High School uh, with their wonderful uh, principal who is here as well. Mr. Heibel, I believe, is still here. I don't see, where is he? He's, he's embedded amongst the students. I didn't see him back there sporting some uh, new look there over the holiday. I won't let anybody say anything more about that. Uh, I shaved mine, by the way. It, didn't, uh, it was more salt than pepper uh, on it in that well. And so... Uh, Everybody's been watching the, excuse me, the Duck Dynasty. Is that what it is? Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> had a little bit of a goatee there, and it was more salt than pepper, and I think that Mr. Hybels is more red uh, than he's got there going on as well. But anyhow, I digress. And I also like to have um, acknowledged Miss Katina Quick McQueen, uh, who is here as well, uh, one of our illustrious assistant principals at Great Mills High School. And she's brought along 12 Great Mills High School students uh, who would like to come over here today. Uh, do we have our microphone? Join me here, if you would. All of you jump up and come over here near me. 
and um, I'm going to have some representative samples, and we want uh, to do some conversation and some introductions, and glad that you're all here. You guys glad to be here today? Yes, a good answer. <laughs> good answer. So why don't you all sort of kind of come in this area here and around, and, and then we'll have Miss Katina Quick McQueen join right here, and uh, your principal as well. Why don't you come around here, Mr. Hyde? We'll get some around this chair as well as we talk and sort of flank me on this area here. So we'll get clo clo close and comfortable. And if you just turn this way, sweetheart, come this way. There we go. Back up a little bit. And board members, some outstanding students from Great Mills High School with our outstanding principal and assistant principal. And they're about to talk to me. And so I'm excited to see what they have to say. Well, Dr. Moderano, on behalf of Mr. Heibel and Great Mills High School and the staff, we would like to present to you a check for $1,023.96 um, for the wow. St. Mary's County Public School Shoe Fund. Oh my God. One thousand twenty-three. Yes. I knew something was going to happen today, but I didn't expect it to contain four digits in a check in that sense. And, and so all of this is going to our shoe fund. So I'll make some comments, but I want you to make some comments to tell us how you came about raising this kind of money. Tell us a little bit about that, and I would like for all of our wonderful young people to introduce themselves, because I know many of them. And I'm going to let our group members here, we have with us um, members of Sisters in Success, and we also have members of the class that raised the most money in the school. Okay. Well, to raise this much money, we had our second period classes donate pennies, like their spare change that they had, and um, well, I guess over a couple, couple of months we raised that much money. Saw but, uh, change. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, I check those sofas every night, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, this class, they, well, there's one class when I picked up chains, there was always this one class that had so much chains that I usually almost dropped it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and. So what's your organization again? It's Sisters in Success, and it's like a group to help um, young women become leaders in their community and Excellent. like that's phenomenal that's <laughs> phenomenal give them a round of applause again <laughs> well there's several rounds of applause here let's pass the microphone if you could uh, to get the, the people to introduce themselves uh, i'm from the class that raised the most money and i think it was easy for us because it was spare change and you don't really use it i know i just toss mine around you know and just bringing it in, it, you don't really know how easily it adds up. And after a while, we, d we couldn't even keep track of how much money we had raised. And in the end, we were, I know I was shocked to hear how much we had raised. And I was really proud of our class because it's going to something that's really important in our community. So. Which class is it? Whose class is um, this? Psychology. OK, yeah. very good. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. I'm Robert Vandergrift, I'm part of the class as well. And I think the change drive was more fun for us than it, well, it was fun because we were competing with Mr. Skinner's AP <laughs> physics class. Oh, so, so yes, so. I see, so then the competitive spirit came out. That's what I was trying to get Yes, at. it was definitely our competitive nature. We heard that they had come ahead of us, so we all pulled together one period, well, all the periods, and put all of our money together and ended up beating them by over two hundred dollars. Wow. <laughs> so. That's great. Was there daily reports? Was there an internal competition where you were tabulating this at that level? Did you know where you stood with that as well? No. Oh, so it was a surprise at the end. Yes. Definitely. Okay, very good. What, All right. What grade level are you in, please? I'm a junior. Okay, thanks. Very good. Go ahead and pass the microphone. Um, I'm a Mark Kankari and I'm also part of the winning class. Very and good. Yeah, I guess we were all really competitive, but at the end, it was just about the money and how much we raised. And your grade level? Uh, 12th. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Tell the grade level as well okay. as you get through. Go ahead, sir. I'm um, Jesse Rayford, and I'm in the class, too. I'm a senior. And yeah, it was uh, pretty crazy how much we raised. <laughs> it is. But keep being crazy and raise more. <laughs> That's good. Um, I'm Emily Stark. I'm in 12th grade. I'm Paris Ferguson. I'm in 10th grade. I'm Kayla Young. I'm in 10th grade. <laughs> I'm Mia McQueen, and I'm in 10th grade also. I'm Kamisha Higgs. I'm in 10th grade. 
I'm Zaire Calhoun. I'm in 10th grade. I'm Elizabeth Pratt, and I'm in 10th grade. I'm Sonora Lewis, and I'm in 10th grade. Hi, I'm Rainbow Lewis, and I'm in 9th grade. And very good. You want to say it? And I'm Mr. Heibel, and I won't tell you what grade I'm in. <laughs> uh, I, on behalf of Great Mills, I'm just so proud of these guys. And I really want to uh, highlight Ms. Quick McQueen and, and, and say a little bit about, you know, a few years ago, we, Great Mills, we, any place, we need programs for our kids. And Ms. Quick McQueen took the event initiative and created her own grassroots program, Sisters in Success, mentoring uh, young females, not, not only in our building, but in the elementary uh, sites as well. And I gotta give her all the world of credit for creating this initiative, a need that was needed. We need it. We need to, we need to provide this opportunity for our kids. Uh, it's a wonderful program. Uh, we also run a men's program. So between the two of them right now, it's offering kids an opportunity that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. And then Miss Weaver's class, love the competitive nature. That's the way we kind of roll at Great Mills. So we, <laughs> we appreciate that. Real proud of them and real pr we're proud to donate to the shoe fund and a worthy cause. That is wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Hybo. I appreciate that. Um, let me just say a couple other words to frame this. Why I'm most impressed with this, you've heard my comments today uh, about the, the, the great need in our community. So let, let me just frame it for you to understand that as you are working in school very diligently on your academics, that you are seated next to individuals that you may not necessarily know all their challenges that they're experiencing. But over 30% of our young people in St. Mary's County qualify for free and reduced meals. And they don't always have the means to be able to provide new shoes or new pants or get those, those gifts over the holidays. And we want to make certain that all of our young people are equalized so that they're not feeling left out. And so the shoe fund has been something that has really caught on in our community. Uh, we put a plea out on a regular basis and get donations from our community members. And what I'm most impressed with is students helping other students. It's so important to me. I want you to achieve at the highest level academically every day. And I know many of you, and it wasn't so hard to introduce yourself, was it? You're sitting back there shy. You want to stand next to me closer? I know you're feeling very good about yourself. Come on over. Come on over. No, just for me. All right. Uh, this has been hard for her just standing here today. But other students helping each other. I want you to always carry that value forward to recognize how we treat the less fortunate and individuals who don't necessarily have the means is how we define ourselves. And that's what's important to all of us in the sense that academic achievement, I want you to achieve your highest level, but don't forget about those who are less fortunate. In our community, we're a very wealthy community in many ways, have a lot of gifts, but never forget that there are individual students and families that are suffering. Uh, we have a number of homeless students in our community. Uh, anytime that number can raise to high as 200, but we want to make certain that when they're in our schools that people don't recognize that based upon clothing or lack of shoes, eyeglasses, whatever it may be. So I appreciate this. This speaks so much to me today to start off the new year with our fine young people in terms of all your academic successes, but more important, your character and your care for each other. I'm absolutely touched. I expected today to receive something. This number, this amount is just phenomenal. And what I can tell you is this is money that will go directly from this check, deposited into an account that will be accessed by our pupil or personnel workers who will buy these shoes that will directly go to the feet of students within our school system. You don't have to worry about where's that money going. There is a process and a mechanism set up where this will go directly from here to our staff members to go purchase at the stores and will event and ultimately get out into the community and will students amongst you may be wearing the shoes that you raised the money for with that spare change. So to whom much has been given, much is expected. And I expect the fact now, I'm going to challenge all of you, challenge your classmates to rise to that level of competition at the appropriate time to continue to do more because those who do, do more. And I'm so proud of your efforts. <coughs> Give them a round of applause if you would please. I'm just so touched. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great seeing you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Great seeing you. It wasn't too bad. Come walk with me. Come on, come on, come on. Great seeing you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You too. You too. Great seeing you. Great seeing you. Wonderful. Great seeing you. How's your brother? Good. Give me a hug. Thank you. Very good. All right, guys. We'll let you get back to school now. Great, Mr. Hyde. Wonderful. Uh, and no snow. Don't be late. Don't be late. Be safe, too. Wasn't that wonderful, board members? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was wonderful.
I knew there'd be a surprise here in Sword Creek, John. Yeah. Mr. Heibel, thank you for bringing the students okay, so over this morning. You. So let me give this check to Mr. North. You can go up and get that. That's wonderful. And get that directly to where it needs to go. And then I'll end with uh, entering into the record. For the last couple times, I have not read all the Work RB Nice Awards, <coughs> and it's a, a long period. I'm just going to enter those into the record as well. But I would like to read and give it justice in this same spirit. The individuals who have now, through their own payroll deductions or through contributions, these are individuals in the community uh, who have made donations uh, to the shoe fund. Uh, heeding to that plead, Mr. and Mrs. John Greeley, Leonardtown High School National Honor Society, Helping Hands of St. Mary's Incorporated, Janet Griffin, Denise Coyne, Alice Otis, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Samblinet, Catherine Sullivan, Randy Tira, Brian Miller, Stacy Sweet, Rebecca Quaid, Don Peelmeyer, Viola Jones, Kimberly Lutz, Melanie Otto, Greg Norris, Marie Lynch, Noel Farrell, Kathy, Catherine Depperschmidt, and Mr. and Mrs. J. Battle. So we commend those community members for making that donation, either through a payroll deduction or a one-time in-kind donation. And we encourage, please, our community, if you have the ability, please continue to contribute because, as I've said, these are dollars well spent, particularly during uh, the winter months when young people have great need. And I thank all the community members for that. So, Dr. Raspa, a very wonderful way to start the new year. So thank you for indulging me to go on a little longer. Absolutely. Dr. Monroe, I noticed there's several principals in the audience. Yes. Including Mr. Hyde. Well, maybe could you introduce them? I uh, will. This time. Uh, they're going to be up for a variety of other things yes. during the recognition uh, through that. But uh, our principals, if you would please stand, if you would. We have Annette Wood uh, from George Washington Carver. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Jeff Garenzo uh, from Mechanicsville. Mr. Garth, a round of applause. Mr. Garth Bowling from Chopticon High School. Uh, Mr. Heibel Mr. has just gone out with the students. And Ms. Fulp from Spring Ridge Middle School uh, is here as well. And we have a few teachers here as well, and a variety of uh, other staff members that you will see present. Mr. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer. Oh, oh, well, Mr. Kramer is director, principal, everything. Mr. Kramer, um, stand executive up. Executive director. Uh, you as can't well. hide. I see you back there. <laughs> and we have Don Simpson, also our liaison, who's come in here yes. as well to join the meeting. So just lots of energy as 2014 starts. Yes. Very absolutely. good. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Monterano. Absolutely. That brings us to recognitions. Moving along, uh, Flow Mentoring, mentoring ce <coughs> celebrates National Mentoring Month. Mr. Kramer and uh, Mr. Tyson. Good morning, board members, and uh, Happy New Year, Dr. Monterano. As you well know, January is National Mentoring Month. And what better way to celebrate National Mentoring Month than by celebrating and recognizing the mentors in our school system who make this program a reality for our students. In 2008, the school system applied for and received a grant from the Office of Safe and Drug-Free Schools. And since that time, we have been able to provide each one of our schools with a quality mentoring program uh, since that time, we've been able to place very caring adults, teachers, students, even at the high school level, community members, in the lives of our children and some of our children who need a little more support. Um, I'd like to recognize and present the person uh, as well who leads this and coordinates this effort for the school system, Mrs. Sarah Tyson. And as she comes up, I'd also like to point out our very own, Dr. Matarano mentioned our student board member who continues to make us proud, we, uh, Peter Widmere. Uh, Peter is also a volunteer and is a flow mentor as well. So yes. hopefully Peter gets a chance to talk a little about what this program means uh, at Chopticon High School. Uh, our principals, uh, many of them are here. I'm, you've been recognized by Dr. Raspa, but thank you for being here uh, to support. Uh, these uh, mentors and the effort that is occurring in your schools as well. So with that, Mrs. Tyson. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <laughs> I'm sad to see all of our Great Mills folks go. That was such, such fun. What a wonderful group. Um, thanks all, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you all for uh, 
our principals for coming to support our site leaders. We're actually our, we're honoring our site leaders here today. Um, before I get started, I, I always want to remind folks what the mission of the Future Leaders of the World Mentoring Program is. Um, our mission is to foster positive mentoring relationships between students in St. Mary's County Public Schools and members of the community. And what the folks that you're going to meet here today do, our site leaders at each of those site at each of our school sites, they provide that supported, safe, and inspiring environment in which to cultivate the potential of each youth. And so those are really special people who are working with the administration in the schools, working with teachers, working with guidance counselors, working with families, who then pair those students up with mentors either from the community or from their school site um, and provide a really um, safe and inspiring and fun place to be that you know our kids really look forward to coming to every week. This is just a picture I always like to show. At our elementary school level we, we support one-on-one -on -one mentoring um, and then at the middle and high school level we have group mentoring. So um, in the bottom left we had our middle school group programs. They all went up to Baltimore and uh, uh, checked out the University of Baltimore, right, <laughs> Mr. Dothard? And they also went to Think Big, Dr. Ben Carson's um, presentation there, which was really fun. We always bring in guest speakers, and again, we try to, um, we are supporting positive relationships between those um, mentors and their kids. I want to share a little bit of data. Um, we have flow programs in 17 elementary schools, all four middle schools, and three high schools in the county. Um, last year, um, we we, uh, we had 250 students who were matched with community or, or mentor teachers. Um, we screened, trained, and placed 120 community members, um, volunteers, um, and we have 43 um, <coughs> site leaders and uh, mentor teachers. Um, last year in our data comparing marking period one to marking period four in our kids, um, we found that 63% of those mentees increased or maintained their GPA, 57% of our mentees um, improved or maintained school attendance, um, and disciplinary referrals for the um, for the group as a whole decreased by 35%. Um, uh, as of June of 2013, teachers reported that over 60% of um, our flow mentees showed improvement in attitude, behavior, and social skills. So those are kids who are coming to school, they're ready to learn. Um, pretty compelling evidence that mentoring really works, and mentoring really works, you know, um, yes, at a national level, um, but here in St. Mary's County, mentoring is working at our elementary, middle, and high school levels. I'm really excited about that. Um, as Mr. Kramer mentioned, we've been, um, we've been in operation since 2008, and we have served um, over uh, um, 1,300 kids um, through flow mentoring, which is really, really exciting. These are kids who have been in the program for a minimum of one year. Many of our kids have been in our programs for two, three, four years. We, we like for them to go from elementary, middle, and up into high school. Um, and we're here today because January is National Mentoring Month. Um, really excited um, about this time where you know the nation really spotlights the importance of mentors um, and the need for every child to have a caring adult in their life. Um, last weekend, St. Mary's College and Flow Mentoring um, celebrated National Mentoring Month at their men's basketball game versus um, Marymount. We had a great turnout of um, mentors, mentees, their families, and site leaders. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was a very, very close game, <laughs> uh, although we were not quite victorious. Uh, and this Monday, Flo and St. Mary's County Public Schools is going to host our um, sixth annual Flo Mentor and Site Leader Appreciation Reception. So we're really excited about that. Um, always, always excited to, you know, we have our mentors who come and they, they meet with their kids every single week. Our mentees come every single week. These are volunteers from the community. And so, you know, this one time of year, we're really excited to be able to thank them, bring them in, and really show them how much we really appreciate them, besides all the, all the cards and thanks they get from their kids every week. Um, I want to remind everybody to look out for our e-newsletter. We do send out a Flow Mentoring e-newsletter every month, and uh, you know we really just try to spotlight the fun activities, um, the giving back to the community that's happening um, with, um, with all of our programs. They're really a community-oriented bunch. It's really... Um, really proud to be a part of um, our flow program. Again, we promote fun, <laughs> fun and learning and connections. Um, today, we really want to um, honor several very exceptional um, individuals who consistently go above and beyond in their role as the flow mentoring site leader. So these are folks who are at their school site. They've been designated as a site leader. They work with administration, teachers, um, and mentors, and they bring them together and host their mentoring session weekly. 
Um, what I'd like to do is uh, um, I'd like to say a few words about each person and invite them up, and then um, at the end we can give out certificates. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have Gina Bonsignori from uh, Mechanicsville Elementary School. She has been with us for four years, and like all of our site leaders, um, she always works hard to provide meaningful and engaging activities for her mentor mentee pairs. If you want to stand right there, thanks, Gina. <laughs> you get to be our first first one up. Um, she orchestrates an annual field trip to Pax River, um, where the mentor mentees get to visit the Test Pilot School Museum. Um, but Gina also helps out in getting the whole flow program running in the late summer and early fall by helping out with mentor training. Um, she goes above and beyond by always being available to meet with new mentors, whether it's at a school, a local library, at Panera Bread, wherever, to uh, meet and prepare them for mentoring. So in the beginning of the year, we are rushing to sort of screen, we heavily screen all of our, our applicants. Um, we wanna make sure they're trained and placed in our, our school sites, and we, we do that all in a pretty regimented way, and Gina has been incredibly um, helpful and uh, flexible in coming out and meeting with fo folks. And she's an expert. I mean, she is a site leader. She, is, she knows um, what a good mentor looks like. Um, so thank you, Gina, for, um, we really couldn't get your, our programs running, running uh, without you. So can we give her a, a round of applause? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Um, next, we have Lisa McCoy from GW Carver Elementary School. Um, she's been with us for five years as a site leader, and she does a really amazing job of recruiting mentors. Um, primarily, her program is, um, is mentored by active duty military and DOD contractors, uh, and uh, she hosts one of our largest mentoring programs in, um, in our elementary schools. Right now, what do you have? 12, 11. Okay, um, last year she really went above and beyond in partnering with the local cooperative extension and developing uh, an organic garden at the school. They built raised beds um, and the kids and the mentors have really taken ownership um, of this project and they're learning where their food comes from and they're giving it back to the community. It's really, really some powerful lessons that I think they're learning and again, it's so much about ownership. The kids are excited about this project. The mentors come in and are excited about this project. And uh, so we thank, we thank Lisa for really orchestrating that and making that happen. So thank you. <laughs> Um, and David Morris from Hollywood Elementary School. He's been with us since the very beginning. This is his sixth year as a site leader with Flow Mentoring. Um, he is a, another powerhouse mentor recruiter um, and has a way of tapping into his mentor's um, talents and, and letting them shine in, in their sessions. Um, he has a way of motivating his mentors and mentees to get excited about their school community and giving back, just like Dr. Martirano was talking about. Kid, we need to be giving back to our school community, our greater St. Mary's County community, our world community. Um, so every year, um, uh, well this year, they collected and sorted, or they sorted 150 boxes of canned goods at the Church of the Ascension Food Bank. Um, this is the fifth year that you all have done that, and uh, every year you just really impress me more and more by your initiative, the organization, and the follow through, and, um, and bringing out that important um, part of our community, which is supporting that, that, that food that food bank that, that helps so much so many folks in our community. So it wouldn't be possible without Dave's leadership and vision and going above and beyond. So thank you, Dave. Thanks for us. And BJ Dothard at uh, Spring Ridge Middle School. Uh, BJ has been with us for five years um, as a site leader. He leads a group of four mentor teachers and um, over a hundred oh, over 20 student mentees at Spring Ridge Middle School. Um, he has a true gift for connecting with the student mentees and encouraging them um, to, to go above and beyond in everything that they do and, and to come to him during the school week and uh, has really created a, a, a true sense of community and a, a, an active mentoring community there at Spring Ridge Middle School. Um, He's really going above and beyond this year by mentoring the other um, middle school site leaders and creating dynamic and meaningful programming for our middle school programs. Uh, and we are just so grateful to have BJ on the team and, and to be really leading our middle school mentoring initiative. So thank you, BJ. And Chicago Smith. 
there you are. <laughs> Mr. Smith, you've been up here a lot lately, I hear, <laughs> from Chopticon High School. Um, he has been with us for four years now, um, since the beginning of our, our mentoring at the high school. Um, you were with us that first year that we, we started mentoring at the high school level. Um, a solid, solid presence at Chopticon, who our kids know that they can turn to any time during the day, whether it's during lunch, in the hallways, during their weekly mentoring sessions. Um, he's always looking for dynamic guest speakers to come in and pushing our kids to really look to the future and aim higher. Um, he's not afraid to go above and beyond for his kids, just like all of the site leaders here today and all of the site leaders um, that aren't here today that are at all of our schools every week going above and beyond. We're so, so very grateful and so proud um, to have you as part of our Flow family. So thank you all. Absolutely. And Sarah, let's give Sarah and Mr. Kramer a huge round of applause. This is one of the many uh, jewels in the crown of St. Mary's County Public Schools, the uh, future leaders of the world, uh, Flow Mentoring, which is a program that has just become so part of much of our, our culture, our institutional practices. I remember when we were applying for the initial funding for this and the grants, and this was not even a part of our vernacular, Flow, what that meant. And now it has just been embraced. It is uh, permeated throughout our entire school district, and I'm so proud. And what I'm most proud about is as I was sitting to dais and watching everyone come up and uh, getting your due justice on the red carpet today, I know all of you, and I know all of you well. And uh, when, when she was reading all of those exceptional words about each and every one of you, I could have put that script away and said all of those same things about you because your character is defined by your actions, uh, not necessarily always by your words. And I've watched all of you in action through my several years of being superintendent as we've worked together. And the beautiful thing about our school district is we get to know each other. We know the relationships with each other. And I'm well aware of your work in terms of your instructional support, the work that you do with our children every day, uh, but more importantly, how you mentor and how you care about our young people. So when children know that you care about them, that is a magical moment then everything else takes care of its place. But if children know that, they do, that you're not caring about them, they also will respond in kind. So when we talk about truly if you're about academic achievement, if you're truly about those high levels of performance of teachers and students and staff members, you gotta connect with the heart. You gotta connect with the heart. And children, staff members, adults, they too respond in that sense knowing that when you connect with the heart, have high expectations and people know that you care about them, expectations can get exceeded exponentially. So I am so proud to know all of you, uh, the work that you represent in our school system. Board members, you should feel very good because these are individuals who truly are just representative of the kind of character that we define as the St. Mary's County Public Schools way, the kind of individuals that we hire, that you have to care about kids, you have to love kids, and you have to truly believe that. And it's not in terms of the words, it's based upon the actions. And a lot of these individuals in front of you, they're very, all five of them I know extremely well, are very humble. They're not out there holding placards saying, look at me, look at me. They're doing the work, and guess what? I watch that work, and I know that work, and I observe that work. And if, you have, if you're about children, they will know. They will know. Children will know that if you're about them and you believe in them. And the work that you do, Sarah, I mean, is just incredible. Mr. Kramer, the leadership that you provided is incredible to be surrounded by all these caring individuals. Again, very <coughs> symbolic as we start the new year in terms of the values that matter. I sent out uh, to our principals on the first day of the, of the new year a chart that defines less and more for 2014. I've asked them to share that with their staff members, you know, and, and more need for care and respect in how we treat each other. And I felt really good because it's a reminder to our organization about what we do and recognizing the less fortunate the children that you're working with uh, need the additional support. So I commend you, I salute you, my hat's off to you, and now I want to present you with a I'd like to present you with a winning lottery numbers or something to that effect. Uh, but today I'm giving you a certificate 
And I'd like you to uh, come over and get that. Gina, please come over and accept your certificate of recognition. And we thank you for your work. Give her a round of applause from Mechanicsville Elementary. Lisa, come on over as well. Now, don't go anywhere because we're going to get a picture. Lisa, thank you for your work as well. Keep your enthusiasm up. It's just incredible. David, come on over, sir. I've known you forever. Uh, great job, sir. Keep your continued work and focus with your values and character with our young people. You're truly making a difference. BJ, come on over, sir. Great to see you again. Your fine words that were said by Sarah and just the work that you do is just incredible and very much touching the hearts of our young people. Congratulations, sir. Outstanding. And Mr. Anton Smith, I will call you by your full and correct name. Uh, he has been busy up here because he is our employee of the year, uh, and we're very proud of that as well. But I watch you in action in terms of keeping our children safe in your role as a security uh, member of uh, Choptecon High School, but also how you connect with our young people. And the one program in particular, all of you can talk about your programs. What is it called on Thursday at Choptecon? Is it Thursday? Tighten up Thursdays. I love that. Uh, just, yeah, so here's your certificate, but I, I mean, I'm not going to ask everybody to speak, but can I put you on the spot and talk to the board because we all need to have a tighten up Thursday. So let's talk just a momentarily. Tell the board what tighten up Thursday is at Chopticon. Thank you, is he, Are you doing it? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. So it's always better to see. Peter's one of my mentees as well. Yeah, so. I can tell he's got his tie yeah. on. Yeah. The purpose of tighten up Thursday on behalf of Mr. Bowling and as well as our SGA program, I introduced this about four years ago. It's called Tighten Up Thursdays, and we host our mentoring programs on Thursday. What, so what better day to get those guys to pull those pants up and tighten them up? <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we've been working hard at that as well. So even if you're not a part of the program, the student body has pitched in. The percentage has gone up as well on behalf of Mr. Bolden as well and our SGA program. So if, if you just wear a college shirt, tuck, tuck the shirt in and pull them up. And you'd be surprised how it's going. It's really grown now. Yeah, so, so we're going to work that into our theme next year. <laughs> 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 we're successful. We'll just tighten up Thursday all throughout so, the land. And I try. To, I, I dress up and I wear a tie every day. I tell the gentlemen, you don't have to dress up, but you know, I try to lead by example. So you sure do, sir. Thank you sure do. Thank you very Thank much. You. So tighten up Thursday. You'll never be the same to you again. <laughs> uh, give these fine individuals a round of applause, if you would. And. So we're going to try to get a picture here, board members, if we could. Uh, if somebody's here to take that. That's wonderful. So yeah. you all just come on up a little yeah. bit further. You're all in great order. <coughs> right there. Your principals, uh, your principals here, join us, please. Yep. If we would. Dr. Moderano, uh, please. We'll go ahead and take oh, a break and take the picture. The board will now take a break. Principals, if you would kind of get. but they're still with us. The board will uh, reconvene at this time. Uh, uh, Peter has a couple of remarks. He uh, asked me if it would be all right if he could make. So, Peter, go ahead. I'd just like to say, uh, me, that this past year, uh, I've been a part of about seven different clubs and organizations, along with soccer and different out of school stuff and volunteering that makes my schedule really busy. And with that, I always make sure that I make time for flow mentoring every week. Whether that means coming to a meeting, maybe a little late if I have to because I had a meeting, or maybe having to uh, reschedule something else because I had flow that day. Uh, I've been a part of the flow mentoring program, uh, the program that was just up earlier presenting. I started la the program last year with Mr. Smith at Chopticon, and for each individual person that comes to Flow Mentoring, you notice that those who come to the program and maybe come once, they stay there. Because through that one meeting, they realize, maybe before they came, that, man, I'm in the high school level, I'm you know, 16, 17 years old. I don't have discipline problems. I, you know, I get, Better good, not. get good grades, <laughs> these things like that. And for, for those kids, and once they go in and say, I, I don't really need a mentor, that's not really me, I'm, I'm doing okay. And then you go and you realize you, there's so much more that you have to learn about not just things that you need to do right, but more things that you need to work on in your life. Things, um, and we work on a lot of things. Uh, for example, it's, it's a group. So you have the support of the group, and each meeting, the first thing we talk about is go around every person, 
what's on your mind? Other than the question, you know, how are you doing? How is your day? What's on your mind? And that really opens up a, a different kind of topic of what's really going on uh, in a person's life. What are they doing? What are they doing right? And they share also what's very important, the, maybe the mistakes they, what they, they made in hindsight. Maybe if they did something this way, it would have been different, and they share it with the group. So then maybe the group next time, a different person won't make that mistake. And even at the middle school level, I go and about once a week, and I've been trying to go to the middle school would help the Margaret Brent kids with, with their homework for about, I'd say, a good 30, 45 minutes. And just sit down and talk to them if they're not doing anything and help them with their homework and sit and talk to them and listen to what they're doing. And they have so many questions about, you know, how's, how's high school? How, how's this going? How, what's it really like? And just to help them out, it, it really does make a difference on both ends. And that's what really what, what matters in that organization is the mentor and what kind of connection they have with the students that they're mentoring. When we have Mr. Smith at Chaptakan, who's amazing at keeping up with all of us, it seems like he's everywhere at once at Chaptakan just throughout the regular day and making sure he keeps tabs on not just the people in the mentoring program, but in the school too. So you have a, a knowledge of things that are going around so you can help your, your mentors and your mentees. And it, it really is a great program and it's one of the reasons that I went out and stopped to get this position on the Board of Education because at first when I heard about it I wouldn't think I would ever do it in a million years because I wasn't qualified and in that kind of measure and then going into the program and learning about different things and getting self so get better self-esteem and self-worth and encouragement from others you you go out and you strive for excellence and you strive for more in your life and that's a little anecdote for me for Titan Up Thursday when I started last year. Actually, it started to be like, you know, every Thursday, wear a collar shirt, wear a belt, tuck it in, you know, look presentable. Then it started to be wear a shirt, wear a collar shirt, wear a tie, wear the belt. Then it started to be wear the tie, wear the vest, wear the, wear the, wear the dress shoes. And then when that, start, when that started happening, I noticed on Tuesday, I would wear my shirt tuck it in, wear a belt, and put the pant in, and wear nice shoes. And that happened, I look at my the wearing one day and say, I just tucked my shirt in, but why? <laughs> and, and that's- that's seemed seem like an untucked kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> to begin uh, with. <laughs> and that's, that's what started to happen. And noticing that when you start to do those things and when your peers start to do it as well, it becomes your standard. To raise your own standard for yourself to become not a different person, but a better, but a better, excuse me, but a better version of yourself. Exactly. Is is just amazing. That's what Flow Mentoring did, the, not just for me, but for all the other students that are in the program. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. Thank you for that addition. Yeah. Thank you. You know, Peter, I think I, every time you speak, you impress me more and more. <laughs> just beautifully done. Thank you. Okay, moving on. There's no public hearing today. There are no public comments. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second it. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Moving on to uh, action items. First action item. Uh, is Mabe and Pazam legislative priorities, Dr. Moderano? Just go ahead and bring up the. Uh... Yep. Get that all set up. Board members, uh, good morning. I think it still is morning. Wonderful meeting to start off the new year with, and I'm very pleased to buy all of this. Uh, the tone of our meetings, how we move into 2014, and. I want to talk specifically about the fact that we're on the, uh, the cusp of the legislative session beginning, the General Assembly session starting. Mm -hmm. And one of my concerns has been during my tenure as superintendent is that uh, being in a mid-sized school system, uh, not necessarily having the, the capacity of staff like some of our larger <coughs> counties have regarding individuals who work in the capacity of governance, uh, monitoring government and legislative issues. A number of the larger school systems present platforms 
uh, where they actually vote as a board in terms of all the legislative things that are coming before them. And uh, we've not been able to do that. We followed in terms of uh, the, the other direction from our professional organizations. So for the first time in my tenure, I'm actually bringing forward to you the position paper, the position priorities for MABE, which is your organization. I'm presenting on your behalf today uh, in, in that sense so people understand what the priorities are for this legislative session. And as you know, in my other role as being full-time superintendent of St. Mary's County, I also serve as the president of the Public School Superintendent Association of Maryland. And one of the expectations I've placed on the executive director this year is to develop a set of priorities for PAZAM as well so that the, the actual piece of all of this is a unification of positions so that when we go forward as superintendents and we're talking across the state, we're singing from the same sheet of music. And the same thing with the MABE priorities as well. And I want to acknowledge our representatives from our association. Uh, we have been sharing the PAZAM work back and forth with MSEA. Um, during my tenure as a superintendent, I have never felt a more synergistic relationship with MSEA than we have in the last several years with the leadership of Betty Weller, uh, Sean Johnson, who is their legislative affairs individual. Uh, we had a legislative session in Annapolis where we met with all the, the leadership uh, of, uh, of the General Assembly, the Speaker of the House, and the, the delegates from the various subcommittees. And we also had in attendance Betty Weller and Sean Johnson, who also understood where our issues were. Uh, one of the main issues I spoke about yesterday, I was asked to speak uh, in front of the task force on post-Labor Day start, uh, school start times, and that was up in Odenton. So uh, after dealing with our issues here at the school system, I drove up real quickly and drove back uh, and presented at least 45 minutes of conversation with the task force to illuminate their thought process. And although they, I, I was allocated uh, 15 minutes of sp spoken time, uh, time to speak on behalf of our position, and then time for questions, they asked if they could have as much time as they needed with me, and I was more than delighted to comply. So about 45 minutes later, provided the aspects of the reality of that decision. So now more than ever, there's a great need for the associations to be in connection and communication with school systems, in connection with the state board, or excuse me, with the, the school system boards, uh, local boards of education, because many things are happening at the federal level and at the state level fast and furious that in many of us feel we have to have a full-time time devoted just to keep up. And now as they begin the legislative session, many bills are going to be dropped uh, because of the nature of the legislative session. You have to realize the uniqueness of this legislative session is that the legislative session will kick off with individuals who are also going to be contended for their races and the primary election being earlier. So there's going to be a lot of campaigning and a lot of individuals who will be dropping bills uh, that may not necessarily make it out of committee, but if they do, they may have an impact in terms of the local jurisdiction and that could have also ramifications for other districts as well. So a great need for all of us, as I look to our, our, my, our MSCA leadership, to stay very connected with what's happening in Annapolis, uh, with what's happening at the state level, so that we are not committing uh, to things that are going to have further concerns for us at the local level. Because right now, we can say St. Mary's County is weathering the, the, uh, the barrage of reform extremely well, uh, based upon how we've approached that. And I'm very supportive of the reform efforts. I have not been very supportive of the process. So as we look at the product of how things are going along, we've been developing a very solid product. But I have not been pleased with the process nor the timeline and how quickly things are moving and not looking at it from the bigger picture. Now, some people may disagree with me in, people in the areas of the reform effort. I want to make certain we're going slow to go fast and things are done right and that we're holding to a level of fidelity to some of our initial agreements, such as the development of the teacher uh, principal evaluation system. And the major tenant of that was, if you remember, was for local agreements uh, to be had and throughout this process, this has been a very uh, adversarial relationship, I have to say, in terms of how that process has, uh, has evolved, uh, where some initial uh, agreements were shifted based upon what is read in terms of legislation, what is read in terms of guidebooks, what is read in policy and statute, and we've interpreted all of that at the local level much different. So we've tried to maintain, we've been successful in that, but there are things occurring right now that I'm being emailed about 
that will be discussed at Friday's Pazaya meeting, which I will travel to Annapolis during that, where great discussions will occur about the state model that goes back to things that we have been concerned about all along. So it's important for all of us to stay connected. It's important for us to watch the legislation. And it's important for you as board members, now more than ever, to be able to espouse the positions with a level of authority, but based upon a foundation. So it's not just uh, individual board members speaking on the behalf of yourself. This is a unified position from the St. Mary's County Board of Education that supports the MABES position. So in conversation with all of you today, I wanted to bring forward as an action item that one I'm gonna share with you for information item, the PZAMS position, priorities, but what I'm asking today in conversation with all of you at your recommendation is that we'll go through the MABES list of priorities and Mrs. Crosby as the representative and Dr. Raspa as legislative representatives, that you endorse this publicly, that you have a conversation about it, that because it's your organization that you make a motion to endorse this, and that then at the end of that, the expectation would be that we would send a, I'll draft a letter on your behalf that you all would sign, that we would send out to MABE and other stakeholders that says that St. Mary's County Public Schools or St. Mary's County Board of Education is behind that priority. That's a much different field than how we've gone about this in the past. So it's been a little bit more loosely coupled. Now I'm asking for you to formalize that so that when you are speaking, you're speaking on behalf of those priorities that are MABES, but also St. Mary's County. And then what I expect is that unfortunately due to the weather, uh, the, the easemic, seismic uh, legislative breakfast had to be canceled this year, that, but ours is still coming forward. That the conversation with our delegation will be based upon these issues, the timely issues such as post-Labor Day start time, the reform efforts, the conversations about MSA, should we have that, the double testing, all those things that I could spend if I had a whole day to spend with you and unpack. Uh, but all of what I'm trying to get at, all of these are in motion and are moving fast and have great implications for our teachers, uh, for our schools, and funding efforts. So without further ado, let me move through these relatively quickly because you do have these uh, in your possession, the, the May priorities. You should have that copy, which I know that you do. So here's your uh, um, cover sheet as the le legislative priorities for May for 2014. We are in this for kids and specifically several quick bullets uh, on that. One is to, excuse me if we can get that, I have that right. Can you see that? It's an eye test, I know it is, but it's just mainly for background. One is to support the, for continued governance autonomy for local boards of education to set education policy and school budgets in opposition to unfunded mandates. Well, that, that makes sense, but also what I'm asking you is to watch the adjustments that occurred in Prince George's County with the governance structure there, where there is now the, the, the issues that occurred with this, the Board of Education and the county executive, and then how that plays out for if locals at any other school district wanted to do that, is that within their purview to do so? And now I'm having great conversations to say certain markers have to be met in order for that to be executed. So if it's a school system that is defined as need for improvement and a need for reform and a reconstitution, and that's supported by the data, then that's fine. But just for the fact of to say arbitrary, arbitrarily and capriciously, I want to, as county executive, I want to now change the governance of the school system structure just because I can. Is that the wise thing to do? I don't think so. There's got to be a need based in terms of that process. The next one is to support full funding for state funding for Maryland Outstanding Public Schools. And again, on that one, uh, may uh, so continue support from the governor and the General Assembly for full funding of public education in FY 2015 state budget. Our public schools are ranked number one in the nation, sustaining Maryland's successes this time of rapid change and rising expectation to prepare all students to be career and college ready. Therefore, uh, the FY 2015 state budget should be built on last year's per pupil amount of 6829 6, and by an increase of 1%. And we're going to talk further about that during my, our, my budget presentation to you about the need of growth versus needs and how we'll go through that. Three, to support for robust state funding for school construction and renovation projects. And we have to realize this is one area that I'm extremely impressed and, and quite frankly, honored to be a part of the state of Maryland as superintendent because there are only three states in the United States that actually allocate 
funding to school construction. Let me say that again. Out of 50 states, there are only three states in America that allocate funding for school construction. So that when you see a lot of individuals having to drop local bonds and taxing authority uh, to raise funding, that's usually at the local level. Uh, we're re really honored in the fact and blessed that we have the ability to have that state funding. And that capital improvement budget uh, investment between 250 and 400 million in school construction each year greatly benefits us. So we're all about that equalization. And then also following the legislation at the local level in Baltimore City, who's, who's asked for an incredible infusion of amount of funds to increase that level. Uh, we are in great shape as far as our facilities in our school district, but also we have need in terms of growth and expectation. And then also understanding that wealth index and where we are. And you know that, that creates me some concern sometimes when you think about the fact is we are a wealthier county. And Brad, our, our, per, our percentage is 63%, 64%. What is it exactly? 64%. And that's been reduced from 70-something 75 to 64 based upon our wealth, meaning that the state picks up 64 percent and the county picks up um, 36 percent of that overall amount. So keeping that in mind, if you're in a county such as Allegheny County, that number is like 93, 92, 93 and 7 percent based upon wealth. So I actually had a conversation about this over the holiday when I was back in Western Maryland to say they're advancing a new high school uh, in that particular community uh, and the state's going to pay 93 percent of that uh, and the locals are paying 70 or 7 percent of it and there's great consternation, great consternation and concern about that local amount of dollars and I talked about the wealth index but I also said about efficiency of state dollars that if there is need for, is, is there a true need there based upon enrollment and growth? All of those numbers are dictated by that. So we have to watch this very carefully. Any shifts in the, uh, the wealth index, any shifts in the formula, but also ultimately supporting the support of school construction. I know MABE supports that as well as PAZAM. Support for sustained local government investments in education. And again, local fu government's funding plays a critical role in uh, each of Maryland's 24 uh, school systems to support continuous improvement in teaching and learning in classrooms. Therefore, MABE strongly supports the maintenance of effort reforms enacted in 2012 to ensure that adequate local operating funding is provided. Similarly, MABE supports sustaining adequate local capital funding essential for financing construction and renovation of high quality school facilities and partnerships with the state. Now, your bullets are very succinct and generic in many ways. Uh, supporting continued governance autonomy, supporting state funding for Maryland Outstanding Public Schools, supporting robust funding for construction, and suppo supporting sustained local government investments in education. And so those are your generic issues. Pazam, when I present those, is, is a little more specific. I'm going to stop there. This is your document and have you weigh in on this. So Dr. Raspa, let me put it back to your board for some conversation about this. Okay, fine. Uh, comments? questions or whatever, additions. Uh, Mrs. Allen? Uh, while it's true that these four sort of general positions are the MABE's top priorities, um, we can't forget that, first of all, um, all of this is determined not only by the legislative committee, but also by um, the resolutions that we right. uh, generate as a resolutions committee on which we have representation and then uh, when we attend fall conference the um, all of us uh, at this table typically um, the, the board members typically attend that and at, it is at our business meeting that we vote on any changes to those resolutions but um, while the, this page and one other are what is loaded into board docs we also need to remember that based on those resolutions, MABE has a series of platforms that really give background and outline in much greater detail, not just these topics, but our other exactly. legislative exactly. priorities. And while they may not be the top four, um, it is those positions that inform um, what we go forward with as, as our board, but specifically as, as MABE, and that's what their, um, our governmental uh, relations person, uh, Mr. Willems, those are basically his marching orders Correct. for um, 
how he will handle any legislation that is is brought forward that has anything to do with legis with uh, education. You know, one of the challenges um, for MABE specifically is that uh, the 24 systems within the state of Maryland are, are very diverse. They go Absolutely. from the very smallest uh, to, to the very largest. And there are times when our interests as local boards are maybe different, uh, whether we're based on whether we're large or small or rural or urban. And, and that can present some challenges for MABE in terms of how they go forward on any particular legislation that's coming forward. So as, as we, uh, as a board, are looking to potentially adopt these four top priorities, I want us to remember that um, there are a, a number of legislative positions and um, on, on uh, charter schools, on special education, private school funding, testing and curriculum, school safety, student yes. discipline, there's a whole laundry list of them. So I, I want us to make sure that if we're going to do this, I, I think we need to consider how comprehensive we want to be in what we're coming forward with. Because certainly, um, when I read through these and I look then at PZAM's uh, pri legislative priorities. I think they're very much in alignment. They're, they they yeah. are alignment. Uh, the thing that I'm asking you for today as a collective board, mm -hmm. uh, and this is all with conversation with all of you, is the endorsement of the MABES priorities is what we're asking right. for mainly. Yeah. I'm giving you for your just for your information to know that there is a level of alignment because I have been put in a position where one there's been tensions and I use that word just to kind of make a point, tensions between myself and another local superintendent because we're not in agreement because we don't have a position to stand stand together on. That's why the need for the PAZAM priorities have been advanced this year and it's been it's brought great calm to our organization in that sense. The second thing is we've all been put in positions where we attend the legislative breakfast sponsored by MABE in Annapolis where there's not necessarily agreement among counties with all of these. And we're not able to speak with authority to say, well, where do we stand with MAPE's positions on this? I think it's just very, it's a first step to say to this board, you need to ex exercise your complete role as elected officials in advocating or also advocating for or against certain pieces of legislation and recognizing all those pieces that you talked about, you'll go down through all those various bills through John Mullum's and you'll yay and nay those as well in terms of where they fit. But I think the, the important part is that the community needs to recognize that in terms of the governance of this school system, that although we're concerned about the daily management and policy and procedures, we have to have an eye on all the things that are happening at the federal and state level because they have great implications for us. And if we're not on top of that, then things happen to us as opposed to us being a part of the process. It that's what we're back, getting at. It goes back to if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. It, well, true. That's, that's a great way and, to put it. I and I that. want to make sure that we are always at the table. Right. Um, because there is too much that goes on at the federal level and, and at the state level that um, that is mandated to us and about which we don't necessarily yeah. have a voice or a choice. Well, and that's a wonderful analogy. I haven't used that one for a while, but I'd rather, yeah, I agree, because right now people can perceive that a lot of us are on the menu and being eaten uh, in many ways, you know, and on a daily basis. And that's how I can tell you for a fact, that's how our superintendents are feeling right now. There's great stress uh, on the locals that trickles greatly to our classrooms with our teachers. Uh, who have to implement this and there's been some several uh, great positions that have been written right now from teachers and educators uh, union leadership etc about the reforms and how it's being presented in many ways so that just so we're very clear what's the expectation here today and it starts the dialogue and keeps everything that mrs allen is in front of you alive well i i would say to my colleagues that I, i'm very much in support of mabe's positions we've had all of us um, collectively have had the opportunity to have great conversation about this, and I, I would hope we well, would support it. Just, Thank just you. To, just to jump on what, what you're saying, you're mm -hmm. on the board of directors up there, and Mrs. Krobs <coughs> uh, went mm -hmm. to the last meeting where these positions were uh, discussed and vetted. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I need to ask a question, sure. uh, and that is, is there any of those positions that we should not Good support. Question. Uh, Good question. There's a laundry list of them, and there are many. 
So I need to ask that before we continue with some, you know, dialogue here, because if there are some that we should not, uh, you know, agree to as a total board, then we, we need to bring that out. So uh, I'm asking Mrs. Allen and Mrs. Crosby if, uh, if there are any. I did not attend that meeting. Mrs. Crosby went. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, normally uh, the counties do support the positions mm -hmm. after the dialogue up uh, in Annapolis. Uh, but as far as this board is concerned, you know, uh, sometimes there's some minority positions and uh, if there are any, we need to bring those out. I think, um, if I understand correctly, what we're doing at this time is asking for our support of made top priorities. Absolutely. That's just simple. Correct. That's what we're doing today, these, what, four priorities, which everything else hinges upon. I think that's the question that is before us today. Correct. I think that's a separate topic if you want the board to discuss you know, specific legislation or right. priorities as it relate to us individually. But MAVE is a collective body that works on the benefit of all boards of education in the state of Maryland. And these are the four priorities that right. you want us to vote on today so you can have a clear understanding and pazam as to what this is what we already agreed on uh, at MAVE. Um, at the meetings that I've been to, and yep. these are the ones that are adopted. So I think what you're asking today is something simple. I think maybe what Dr. Rasper is asking is something different about particular yeah. uh, uh, legislation, well, but these priorities yeah. here yeah. are basic priorities. Yeah. I, I, I <laughs> just want to add a little bit here before we go in. Uh, maybe I'm getting too far ahead of this, but in any event, I just don't want it to appear that we're just agreeing as a total board on these priority ones, and then, <coughs> excuse me, then it'll appear that we're not interested in supporting the rest of yeah. the statements. I mean, well said. That, that's that's, that's the only thing I, I really have a concern about, and I think we should be concerned about that. I, Yes, we probably support all these four, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bullets yeah, exactly. here. But we don't want people in the state to say after we do a letter and we come out with all this, oh, well, St. Mary's County Board of Education is not interested in the rest of it. What I'm asking the board, and this has been in conversation with all of you, is today to acknowledge publicly what the priorities are for your organization, mm -hmm. that you endorse that as a state as a, as a Board of Education for St. Mary's County, in turn, you will sign a letter that sends that off to the leadership of MABE that says, mm -hmm. we have reviewed the priorities, we have vetted the priorities, we support the priorities, and we had the public conversation. We've not done this before. Yeah, well, that, and, that, that's fine. That, that part, and the then when other things... That, yes, that's, that's great yeah. if, we, if we proceed and write it up that way. Yeah, but then, <laughs> sir, when any counter... What I would hope, this is, becomes the springboard for us to watch very carefully the legislative cycle, if something comes up controversial, I can bring that back to you. You would ask me to bring it back. Right. You can have the discussion in public. You can vote again on that. And then we can send a letter that says something about that. I would like to see more activity with the Board of Education involved in a formal position on the legislative matters yes. in Annapolis with those positions. And this is their first attempt to do that. Okay. Uh, I, I understand, I just want this group to understand that this is a single page out of a multi-page document that has been pulled. Mm -hmm. And we need to be clear whether it's this single page yes, that we right. are endorsing or whether we're endorsing the entire legislative package. Right. Okay. True. Okay. What? So that's a that's, that's a, a your your exactly. Game. My intent was to extract this set of priorities in the introduction as the overview to say we endorse that, and we can also word it, and then we will continue to give review of the specific components of that as they play out through the legislative session, 
and then say play out with St. Mary's County. That's a wonderful distinction. Right. I wasn't thinking in those terms. I was thinking more macro because Pazam will do the same thing. Ours are written so generic as far as priorities, but as each one of those bills comes up and there's something to nuance, like for example, we didn't address anything specifically about Labor Day in here. That's, that's not something that would be like an outlier, but it falls in a general category. Right. But we have a position paper on that uh, in that sense. So I'm seeing what you're saying, and it's very clear. If you can just extract it at that level, that's what we would get at. And then it just allows me to frame your words a little different. Exactly, because okay. the, the document used by MABE is taken as a whole, right. not as the single page. And that's, gotcha. uh, we need to be careful about the distinction we're Okay, making. okay. All right, that's good. That's fair enough. Thank you. That's, that's what All I right. understood. Yeah, that's what yeah, I understood right. the superintendent wanted from us today was okay. uh, approval of these made top priorities for 2014, those four, and everything else hinges on that, just like the board yep. has its um, goals. Correct. And everything hinges on Correct. that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was looking yeah. at. I wasn't looking at the total package. Yep. I was looking at this is what you want from us today. Yeah, good distinction, and I understand. It's just a matter of tweaking the words. By virtue of adopting the priorities, you may not inadvert you, you may view as inadvertently you supported the whole package. Mm -hmm. We will add that distinction to language. Good points on both your parts. Yeah. I got it. Okay. Um, you want can anything? I ask uh, you? Uh, please? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, John Willem said that um, we could call him any time. And if you look at this, and I'm sure some of you already have his phone number, it's down at the bottom of the page. Uh, there's his phone number. Also, you can go on the web at mabe.org, and that's another way that you can, uh, it says here what his email is, but you can find that too, because he took, they took some of the time last time to teach us, this is kind of interesting, how to use an iPad. <laughs> because we brought our iPads and there were some new elected board members there and they tried to teach us how to use our iPad to find priorities and things like that. So you might want to go on to MAID.org okay. and take a look at it. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Matthews. I'm looking forward to as a system we're growing and I, I think this is a good step that yeah. we need to take. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm with the rest of my board that Mabe's top priorities, those top bullet points, I, I have no problem supporting, but I think we need to spend a little more time vetting the process and reading the documents and, and exactly. do a, maybe a little more in detail. Yeah. And I think the natural progression of the legislative cycle will allow for that. We go together at the end of January uh, to Annapolis together. We'll be to, get, to look at that. Uh, I know you have more examination of the individual bills. Um, and I'm delighted that we're having the discussion in public, right. you know, about legislative topics. I mean, it's a, it's a big step. We've not done this before. I know I'm being redundant, but we need to take that position. As long as we know that we're making the distinction about those four main priorities, uh, the way I'm looking at the Pazam main priorities and everything flows from that, and then we can advance it and at, at, at your need. I mean, it might be right. the fact that next year we have a whole work session on the May document completely. I'd like to get to that level where we're sitting around the table and having the discussion individually by individual, but that takes a little more time. That does. First step. Yep, first step. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you have any no thoughts about this? Okay. Okay, so I think, um, sound? Okay. Um, to guide you along, and I'm sorry that that got a little bit clunky there in terms of the distinction, my intent is to bring those four. Uh, what I can do at the, at the board's pleasure right now is I can continue with the overview of the Pazam because more that's for information or you can advance this now with a motion to endorse this, uh, the four priorities, and then I'll re-engage and just talk about the Pazam uh, issues. Whatever your pleasure is, I'll defer to you on that. Well, are the Pazam positions are basically it's just information information for it's just information it's not okay. an action item all right well we we, uh, we can do oh, that any, any thoughts well, on this the, yeah I know the motion, the motion that's motion here is different. is different than what you're saying well <laughs> you, you are correct <laughs> not to put you on the spot uh, however I, I do know that so I'm, I'm doing a little bit of an audible here uh, if let me let me rephrase it after I present the Pazam items mm -hmm. 
If you're comfortable in endorsing them as a local board, we can include that in the motion as it currently stands. During my thought process as this is going deeper, I have not spent the time with you it's for you to understand all the nuances of the Pazan position. And this has already been endorsed by the superintendents as a, an independent agent. Uh, so I'm kind of doing a little meeting audible here in that sense that I can present it if you feel comfortable endorsing it as a result of my recommendation. That's your prerogative to say that I've brought it forward to you as the motion stands. It's strictly six of one, half dozen of another for the other one. So. Well, I, I just thinking about it here uh, momentarily, uh, I would have to say that uh, I think you should go ahead and give the Pazan position okay. on it so we, we have a total clarity of the picture. Okay, very good. Babe, and, excuse me. Yes. Uh, when I went to Maeve and I gave you a copy of this yes. too, they listed... Uh, their positions are in here, but also Pazams are in here too. Exactly. Pizams too, but they're 2014, and these, that's what, 14, 15, I right. believe. Yeah. And then that's, and that's a huge step within itself because this is Pazams' first opportunity and first attempt to have this written document before us. So we've all been out there sort of floating on our own on it. That's excellent because the conversation, I said we've been having the conversation with MSEA as well as with MABE to show that we're all in connection at that level. So let me proceed. Uh, Mrs. Allen has already revealed upon review of that that there is alignment with those positions. There's nothing radical uh, in regards to it as far as something major different. But there are a number, a number of specifics that aren't necessarily contained in the introduction of those four priorities. So let me go down through those. And we'll determine at the end your level of comfort as far as endorsing those at the end. And really, I can, I can handle this as either information or as action. The action would actually strengthen my position and authority to say that my board supports and endorses the Pazan position, but that's not necessarily something needed. Yeah, but don't you think, from what you just said, that it would be a good idea to do that? Oh, I would love it. Yeah. I just don't, I was thinking. As a superintendent and as president of the state you know, yeah. organization, uh, I think it'd be very, very important. Yeah, I've already shared with my colleagues that I was bringing this forward to my board today for discussion as well as a May position and have encouraged them to do the same with their board. So this mm -hmm. should be occurring across the state now at that level. And as I start the meeting on Friday, I would like to provide in my introductory comments this discussion. So ideally, yes, if we can get to that level, but acknowledging Mrs. Allen's comments about the or the, the MABE document that contains a lot more detail, I don't want to put you under any unnecessary uh, consideration because I haven't provided the background on all this. This is just strictly for information as well. Okay, so let me go into that in detail. What you see in front of you is the legislative policy statements for FY14 and 15 for the Public School Superintendent Association of Maryland. And again, very clearly in line with what you've talked about. First is about funding. We got a little bit more specific in regards to the funding of operating, the establishment of a Blue Ribbon Commission to review the current state funding formula and critical components that influence state and local governments, and really trying to do a, a preliminary conversation about pre-K. If you've noticed, all the individuals who have announced their candidacy for governor have all put together some form of plan regarding universal pre-K. Now, we're all about that, but we've taken a deeper dive to say that we want to have an examination of the funding formula to include pre-K in the overall uh, full-time enrollment component of the state education aid formula. That's a whole different kind of examination because it's not such as, that, as it is now because they're half-time students per se. Applied to the pre-K children, uh, the additional needs included in the indices for special, special needs, free and reduced meals, qualifier, and limited English language uh, proficient students. Provide an accurate annual cost of living allowance that maintains consistent procurement value and evaluate <coughs> the GC, the Geographic Cost of Education Index, GCEI, formula to ensure accuracy with relevant data. So those first, uh, those Roman numerals are all <coughs> devoted to the funding examinations of the current operating budget for state aid. B is ensure that local government funding requires and maintains the proper relationship with state government and funding requirements. Again, simple statement, but very important. 
Let me say that again, ensure that local government funding requirements maintain the proper relationship with state government funding requirements. And that gets at, in that simple sentence, the aspect as the state increase has occurred, the county decrease, the, the county contribution has decreased throughout the years. And that's caused great concern for individuals in Annapolis versus the local levels. Uh, and then it has a different interpretation at the local. But we've seen, I guess, the direct correlation of the increased level of the state level, the contributions at the county level has gone down, percentage of that overall. The, the next one is C, to include a set of components in the state funding that recognize local governments for investments in public education above, above, above the minimum requirement. And what that's getting at is the whole conversation about maintenance of effort. I mean, we've been fortunate that our county the last several years, uh, or several of the, the last several years, I should say, uh, has funded education above the maintenance of effort. But a number of counties in the state, as you know, have not, and then there's been the conversations about waivers. So what kind of rewards or incentives would, would exist to encourage locals to provide above maintenance of effort so that there would be that level of parity or expectation about state and local funding? The next one is, in a re is, is general regarding the funding of capital, and that all ties into everything that you've had presented as well, but also acknowledges in B, provide funding above the current process to assist with major educational program expansions, such as extended day or an enrollment expansion of pre-K education. So we know that during the conversation about universal pre-K, there's going to be, need to be a companion or compatible conversation about capital improvement because as it currently exists, our schools throughout the state are not equipped with the facilities to provide full day K for every young person of that age without a heavy lift in terms of uh, a construction expansion process. <laughs> so that's acknowledged in there. And C, to continue to provide funding that supports local safety improvements resulting in more secure learning environments for students and employees. And we've done a very robust job of that at the local level. Three is regarding employee relations. And if you follow this piece clearly, there's been a lot of uh, legislation regarding uh, the, the Labor Relations Board, a variety of other issues. And Pazam's position right now is maintain a moratorium on any changes to current collective bargaining law so that recent legislative changes can fully be implemented and the resultant impact be evaluated. We're just asking for the opportunity to let things settle in for the changes that have occurred so we can see the impact of that before any adjustments have been made because there's been conversations about tinkering around the, the edges of some of these things and they haven't been fully realized yet in that sense. And then again, maintain the current relationship regarding the responsibilities of the State Board of Education and the Public School Labor Relation Board and resolution of labor and management disputes. And that's still evolving in that sense uh, with that overall relationship and we want to continue to evaluate that as well. The next area is in the area of what's a teacher retirement system, which we've had great conversation about, and we need to make certain we're advocating for this. The implementation of the transfer cost of teacher pension benefits to local boards of education is not fully implemented until FY 2017. That's a statement. Do not impose further fiscal requirements on local boards of, of education and therefore local governments until fully impact is realized and evaluated. And again, how is that shifted back and how does that play out for the locals because there's been a big shift of those state funds and expectation to the local level regarding that. And then B, do not reduce the current level of benefit of employees enrolled in the teacher pension system or increase the required individual contribution. We're asking for everything to remain the same. No tinkering again, but there's great interest as MSEA knows uh, very well, uh, as I was invited uh, by MSEA and NEA to speak in D.C. about the great concerns about pension systems, uh, the sustainability, and a movement afoot to basically kibosh uh, many of those benefits. And we view that as a major concern, promises made or promises kept, and a major piece in terms of the recruitment and re being able to retain highly qualified teachers. And that piece is extremely significant. As for Roman numeral number five, the education <coughs> reform, uh, this one creates some concern and we had, this was probably the area we had the most conversation about as far as getting some agreement to maintain the integrity of the state and local boards of education responsibility to provide st 
uh, ongoing direction regarding instruction and related student services. And that's getting at the reform, local control versus state uh, in there. Include superintendent uh, representation. And you, you might think that this sounds just so uh, pedantic, simple, oversimplified, whatever word you want to use. But it, superintendents are not always included in the conversation uh, that needs to occur. We have to fight for a place at times, and so does our representatives from our associations. And you might think, isn't that just a natural progression? No, it is not. Uh, we assess those various task force, various committees, and assert ourselves to have representation. Continue to review and analyze state board's actions that impact the ability of local boards of education to provide a high quality of education. And again, this board recognizes the importance of that just around the whole conversation about the discipline policies and shifts and changes. And our staff members will be bringing that forward in terms of discussion in the near future. But in isolation, the state board has operated without a lot of feedback initially from <coughs> locals on that and operated at a different level. We've had to assert ourselves for representation on those committees as well. Last and final piece in that area is consult uh, with uh, local school superintendents regarding proposed changes to current public school law and practices to ensure accurate level of understanding of current law and the possible impact of contemplated changes prior to filing any legislation. So the importance there is lots of things sound good. So I bring my science and physics analogy up for every action there's an equal or an opposite reaction. And very much the case yesterday when I was in front of the task force uh, about post-Labor Day start for 45 minutes yesterday, they threw things out as far as conversation that they thought would just sound great. And I'm not in terms of necessarily wanting to be the voice of negativity, but I said, let me tell you, and I used the analogy, for that reaction, here's the opposite and equal reaction. So can't you just shift the school system calendar, sir, after Labor Day, and there will be no problems. Well, okay, so I push now everything into June, and you're going to have a whole series of other issues when you're talking about people not being able to vacation in August. There's a lot of people who do vacation, if you're going to use that very simplistic argument, who vacation in June. And the warmth and the temperatures and the season and all that stuff are getting closer to, 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 uh, to July all the implications for that. That's what that encompasses there to make certain we understand fully a well-informed decision. And I'm trying to move fast, but these are not allowing me to move fast. Uh, Roman numeral six, safety and security. Uh, public school students must be able to attend school and learn in safe and secure environments. Mm -hmm. Recognize the social changes impacted the ability of students to attend school with their primary focus on learning. Require that all constituents responsible for securing desired learning environments be held responsible. Ensure that the differences in socioeconomic demographics do not have a negative or detrimental impact on students and provide wellness programs that improve family health, therefore resulting in more healthy children prepared for learning. And we need to acknowledge that poverty matters and that it's a major consideration in decision making. And as we're trying to focus on the achievement gap, what are we doing to equalize and close that poverty gap? And that's the main thematic approach to that. Local autonomy speaks for itself. Resist additional transfer of costs or unfunded mandates to local governments. I think that's probably directly pulled from the, the, the MAVE's position in many ways. As a key partner in the funding of ed public education, local governments must address boards of education's fiscal requests to ensure students are college and career ready. And again, the, I wish the conversation were to occur to maintain local control about the post-Labor Day. I'm just bringing that up because it's a real example. Uh, to maintain local control and acknowledge, as I stated yesterday with them, I said I defined the term mutually exclusive. What is the definition of mutually exclusive is two individual pieces that are incompatible, like apples and oranges. I can't disagree that they want to change the post-Labor Day calendar for the fact of increasing revenues, but not by virtue of the school calendar. I'm all about that. I'm all about increasing academic improvement. I like apples just as much as I like oranges. Don't make me choose between the two. They're mutually exclusive in that sense. And so making certain that as we think about the argument should be local control and how can we work together to provide the supports for children who don't necessarily have all the benefits of supportive families who can't go on vacations, et cetera, et cetera, in that arena. So the understand that the uh, next one is to understand that local boards of education are responsible for decisions that significant impact 
on the quality of education for students, quality of life for citizens, the future success of local business organizations, examples, current expenses, capital budget, school calendars, educational transformation matters, career and college readiness. And that was our only attempt at getting that school calendar in there. Local autonomy, local control is what we're pushing for. And number eight and final is the great concern for us regarding public and non-public education organizations. Uh, superintendents respect the right of organizations to open and administer education entities in a non-public environment, but they adamantly oppose the use of public funds to assist these entities. And the General Assembly is responsible to provide and fund the public education program for Maryland <coughs> citizens and should not be distracted by considerations for private institutions that are not required to follow public policies or procedures. So I present that to you very proudly. Uh, quite frankly, because I'm very proud, as you know, to be a superintendent, but very proud to be the president this year as we advance some true value statements about where we believe as a voice where there's a lot of cacophony of noises right now in the background uh, that are possibly going to get some traction and we need to be able to come out with some strong support uh, to oppose some of those pieces coming through the legislative process. So I present that for your edification. Um, Feel free to ask me any questions. Again, generic statements, and we have position. Po posi we will have position papers and uh, position letters on specific pieces of legislation. Um, I have been invited to come up before Sheila Hickson's committee to present this as well. Uh, you will receive an invitation if you have not already put it on your calendar. I can't remember if uh, Sandra through the snow days or not. Uh, the Southern Maryland delegation has invited us uh, to a meeting with them again. Uh, in January, and I will use this with the other superintendents as the basis for discussion, uh, as well as any of the specifics regarding discipline or transfer of teacher pension, uh, whatever they want to talk about. But mainly, the, the hotbed issue right now is regarding uh, maintaining academic achievement, uh, the concerns of overburdening our teachers, the non-commonsensical ways of operating regarding the administration of MSA, MSA at a time when that is moving away, the curriculum isn't aligned, and moving to the park assessments. So lots going on, uh, but we needed to pull this together. So mm -hmm. I end with that. All right. I, I think uh, you've made it a, a, that presentation with the Pazam's priorities, I think, has made it a lot clearer. At least it has uh, for me. So we know where uh, we are on both sides of the line, so to speak. The superintendents on one side and Board of Education is on the other side. So I, I think it was good to do this. But in any Great. event, further questions uh, <clears throat> or comments about this before we uh, consider doing uh, a vote on it uh, to endorse MABE and PAZAM's legislative positions for 2014 and 2015. Mrs. Allen. It, um, you're right, Ms. Washington. The, um, uh, I do agree with um, the PAZAM's um, positions as set forth. Um, they, they are very much in alignment with not only le MABE's legislative priorities, but MABE's legislative positions as well. Um, the, uh, with respect to the, the funding piece, um, you go a little bit more in depth right. uh, here than than Mabe has in their um, in their top priorities, but it's interesting because um, Mabe has begun to have a discussion about um, finding a way to advocate for uh, another blue ribbon commission because um, the the first blue ribbon commission, uh, the Thornton Commission, that ultimately. Uh, resulted in the Bridge to Excellence Act. Um, my understanding is that that legislation called for um, another review and an update at a right. later time, that, and that has not taken place. And it very much needs to because there, there are concerns about the um, impact of the cost of living that uh, is not reflected in the Bridge to Excellence funding formula, um, the geographic cost um, to counties uh, is is another piece so as well as the pre-k um, and and for the fact that you detail a bit more here than Mabe does I I like this the way this is written so um, I would definitely support uh, endorsing Mabe's 
legislative priorities as well as the legislative policy statements presented by PZAM. And I appreciate that. And again, this is sort of a, I don't want to over exaggerate by saying it's historical. This is a first time for me bringing this forward to you, but this is PZAM's first time of stepping out in a unified voice. And there's a lot of work that went into getting this, trying to get uh, a sense of consensus with 24 superintendents. Imagine that. Uh, and how many iterations we had to go through. But the, the language was enough supported in a way that we could get to this level. Mrs. Washington. No comments. Okay. Uh, Mr. Matthews. I, I think that two different policy statements do align very well and find support. Thank you. Mrs. Scrooge. I um, also endorse both of them. That's great. Uh, the first one is more more simple <laughs> simple as it is but it, they're both good and they have good priorities i'm sitting here thinking about that pre-kindergarten one right uh they brought that up and talked about it quite extensively yep. that they're not included as ftes correct that, and i'm correct on that one and You're i correct. think it is a good idea because they're there right <laughs> they're using space well and, and i have to view it as mrs crosby you know when i talk about our enrollment i talk about close to eighteen thousand. but that official enrollment depending upon how you're using that number doesn't include the ftes i talk about the children that we supervise every day whether you're full-time or half-time it's the number of children that we have in our system and they ha we treat them as ftes except they're only there for half the services and for half day when yeah. that happens Universal kindergarten. That's going to be quite interesting uh, in cost. Oh, absolutely. And it's very, a very beneficial for many children now. And then I'll be quiet so we can go ahead. And I will get you the business plan. There is a business plan espoused to it, but it's upwards of, could be, I, I won't even tell you exactly. It's, it's, it's millions of dollars to do this across the state. Now, I and many of us have sent our own children, grandchildren. Sure. You know, baby children, I have right. to think that, to kindergarten. Yeah. And it's been really beneficial. And I suppose some still will. At, I don't know why. Well, we have to let's see how it plays out, but it's going to be a major uh, platform piece for our governors who are running for the state of Maryland. And uh, it's something that I feel is the next heavy lift that needs to occur in the state of Maryland if we're truly after achievement because it gets at that closing the, the achievement gap closer to birth yes. that we can get. Yes. So we're servicing a lot of our three-year-olds right now, a lot of our four-year-olds uh, through the variety of programs that we currently have. But I would like to see a more uh, universal, universal kind of approach towards that. I like it. Good too. comments. I Doc endorse both of them. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, no comment. But Peter, I know this is a little foreign. Uh, a little, a little bit. <laughs> it's a wall. Just to just agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, this was a good way to do this, to yeah, present good. both sides. And I think we're ready for a motion. <clears throat> and modify in any way. Um, I move that the Board of <clears throat> Education endorse MABE's legislative priorities and PAZAM's legislative policy statements. FY 2014 and FY 2015. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Good. I mean, congratulations and thank you for that because now that gives me the authority to speak on your behalf uh, as well as saying that you've endorsed us as well. So thank you. Yeah. And yeah. I, I know that um, as a follow-up to this that you will then be drafting a letter to this Absolutely. effect yes, on our behalf yes, as is your responsibility yes yes, yes. thank you we'll do. don't forget to add our letter we sent to senator mikulski on pre-kindergarten oh okay i see what you're saying you see what i'm saying we were a forerunner on that piece okay gotcha all right next uh action item Approval of pre-qualification of general <coughs> contractors for the limited renovation and addition at Spring Ridge Middle School. Mr. Harwick. Good afternoon. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Uh, board members, this is uh, an action item which is the first step uh, in the multi-step competitive bid for the renovation and addition at Spring Ridge Middle School whereby potential bidders submit a uh, qualification statement 
uh, and document to us prior to the price bids. Uh, the qualification statements are then evaluated to determine if the potential bidders are qualified uh, by virtue of meeting a minimum criteria. And only those bidders that are deemed qualified uh, at the first step are allowed to submit price bids at the second step in the procurement. And this is a step that we successfully used for the first time with the bidding of Captain Walter Francis Duke Elementary School. Our pre-qualification package is quite extensive. In that package, we asked uh, for a for formal application and certification of all the information provided. Uh, the potential bidders are to provide a statement of qualifications and, and a, uh, su uh, submit a questionnaire. Most importantly, they're asked to provide a statement of understanding of the project. Uh, and for our process, we ask that they submit three representative projects constructed in the last 10 years that are equivalent to the scope and complexity of the Spring Ridge project. We also asked in this pre-qualification process for the potential bidders to submit to us a phasing narrative, a uh, phasing of an uh, a phase construction proje project in an occupied building is, is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that the potential bidders truly understood the demands uh, of that requirement. We asked for a management plan uh, and resumes of key personnel, such as a uh, senior project executive, project manager, and the superintendent. Uh, we asked that the potential bidders submit a representative uh, critical path uh, schedule, which is critical to, to the management of these projects. We asked the potential bidders to demonstrate that they could meet the 15% uh, MBE subcontractor participation goal that we set for this project uh, and provide us a plan to make sure that they had an outreach program that would uh, satisfy that goal. We asked that they provide evidence uh, that they are in good standing in the state of Maryland. And finally, in terms of financial stability, we uh, require them to submit a letter of surety uh, whereby the surety states that they can't, they uh, will provide the necessary bonds for this project, uh, and that surety has to meet a minimum criteria of A minus as rated by AM Best. We advertised this uh, invitation to pre qualify on November 21st, 2013. Uh, we had 12 uh, contractors request the uh, pre qualification package. Three firms submitted. Um, the technical proposals on December 13th. And we've attached to the agenda item a summary, our summary of the evaluation of all three of those firms. Uh, the first firm, J.A. <coughs> Scheibel, obviously well known to us. Uh, J.A. Scheibel um, has a long history of successful projects with St. Mary's County Public Schools. Um, I, if they were the successful bidder on this project, it would be their 10th project uh, for us. Um, of course, most recently they were awarded Captain Walter Francis Duke Elementary School, and I'm glad to report to the board, just as a side note, that uh, that project is, is going well. We're about two weeks uh, ahead of schedule at this, at this juncture. They submitted, of course, um, representative projects, including the limited renovation at Learntown Middle School, Margaret Brent Middle School, which obviously of the same complexity uh, as our project. They have $200 million of bonding capacity, and their surety has an A rating. The, the next two firms um, I'm very familiar with uh, by reputation and a little bit of uh, experience with. They may not be known to you. Uh, but the first is J. Vinton Schaefer and Son. Uh, they're located in uh, Hartford County. They were founded in 1919. Uh, they have a superb uh, reputation in Maryland. Most of their work is as construction managers. 90% um, of their work is in uh, K through 12 work. Uh, over the last <laughs> decade, they've done um, about 50 uh, projects of similar scope as this project. They've worked extensively with TCA architects, uh, one of our preferred architects. Uh, they've uh, TCA has done over 20 projects with them and gives them uh, excellent marks for their, for their work. 
Um, we also, TCA also uses uh, Schaefer and Sons for cost estimating. So they actually uh, did the cost estimate for Evergreen and Duke. And we felt so strongly about them when we were in the Leonardtown Middle School project, we asked them for a second cost estimate. Uh, and it, it was very close to the, uh, to the bid. So high, uh, high uh, regards for Jay Vitton, uh, Schaefer and Son. The third firm is probably one of the largest firms in uh, Maryland, uh, Whiting Turner um, Construction Company, founded in 1909, long history in, in Maryland. Uh, but this firm consistently ranks uh, nationally in the top uh, 25 educational construction firms. Uh, over the last 20 years, they've done over 300 higher education K through 12 projects, uh, worth about 1.7 billion dollars. So it's a, it's a very large firm. Uh, they'll do four, million, four billion dollars of construction work a year or so. But what they bring to this project is the tremendous resources. Uh, they can do a lot of their, they can self-perform things like structural steel, structural concrete. They can self-perform mechanical. Not that they will necessarily do that on this project, but if there was a need there, uh, the expertise and the resources are there. Uh, again, uh, high, high marks from Howard County Public Schools uh, and others. So these are, in our, uh, in our estimation, these are three outstanding uh, firms uh, so that we recommend that you pre-qualify J.A. Scheibel, J. Vinton, Schaefer and Son, and Whiting Turner for this project. <coughs> With that, I'll take a question. Yeah, out, outstanding. These are three great firms. There's no question question about it. Okay, uh, questions and uh, or comments, Mr. Hardwick. Peter, uh, no questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Crosby. As usual, as usual, <laughs> you're very thorough, and um, no, I have no questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matthews. Great job. Looks like we've got three people getting ready to. Give us some nice bits. Thank you. Mrs. Washington. I think this is a great way to do it because it saves us time, energy, and money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Mrs. Allen. I think they've said it all. Thank you. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, we need a motion. I move that the Board of Education approve the pre-qualification of general contractors for the limited renovation and addition project at Spring Ridge Middle School as presented by staff. Yeah, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Everyone in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a short break at this time. Before we get into information items, I just want everyone to know that after we adjourn the meeting, uh, we will break for lunch and have the work session after lunch. Uh, I know there's some people in the audience. <laughs> make the audience happy. That, uh, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll do better with time management. Or wondering what, what we're doing. Well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, you meant that seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hope it wasn't a close up on that shot. <laughs> okay, first information item high school program of studies. Dr. Marr. Well, good afternoon and Happy New Year. Good afternoon. I am pleased to present our recommendations for revisions to the high school program of studies. Um, before I do, I also want to thank our group of content supervisors who are here as well to help answer any questions that are content specific as we get into it. So um, I just want to applaud and thank uh, the members of that team who um, are, are incredibly dedicated and work very hard to make sure that our students get the best instruction, our teachers have the greatest level of support. So thank you all. Call them by name, please, if you would. Sure. Uh, today with us, we have Ms. Michelle Gallant-Wall, the Supervisor of English, Mr. Kevin Wright, Supervisor of Social Studies, uh, Mr. Jason Hayes, Supervisor of Science and STEM, 
Ms. Laurel Dietz, Supervisor of Fine Arts, and Mr. Mike Egan, Supervisor of Career and Technology Education. So, uh, consistent with policy IGA, we're presenting these recommended proposals for the revision of the program of studies to you today with the first reading uh, in uh, three weeks. We will be having the public hearing for this and then a recommendation for action of approval of these uh, revisions at the February 12th meeting. This is a, a long process. Uh, it actually begins as soon as we approve and implement this year's program of studies. We always look at what's going on and what needs to change as we go into next year's program of studies. Uh, this proposal review process has been going on since the summer. It is uh, kind of a grassroots uh, process that begins with the teachers and students' interest and in what recommendations they have to, for changes to courses. Those proposals are submitted um, by teacher teams, counselors, administrators. Uh, they're reviewed first at the site level, and uh, this year what we uh, implemented was a team-based review process at the site level. So they had to be reviewed by the content department, uh, whether it was, a, you know, for many of these classes, uh, science classes, for example, the department and department chairs, or the counseling department, um, administrators, directors, parents, and students at school who have made the recommendations. Uh, then we come together for a series of meetings uh, in the fall, December, and November. We had meetings, and then we're bringing it to you for review. This is the list of the review team that included teachers, counselors, administrators, um, central office staff, as well as um, Ms. Trish Post from the County Council of PTAs, who uh, brought forth questions and, and recommendations from parent groups. And you'll notice the last bullet on there is over 40 teachers at those site-based review teams. So each one of these courses that were reviewed um, were reviewed by teacher teams first. So uh, we bring to you these new courses that we're proposing for next year. Uh, the first one was brought together by student interest and teacher interest, and as well as uh, a need to expand some English electives, and that is a course on mythology. And so um, that is the first course. The second course is, uh, provides for a split of the AP World History Program at the GIS pro uh, uh, program at Leonardtown High School. It's currently a double-blocked class. This uh, split will keep AP World as one of those credits, but also create a second course for that second half of the block, the Introduction to Global and International Studies as um, an elective course there that um, also provides some greater flexibility in the scheduling of that course. So rather than having to do a double block uh, sequentially within the schedule, it allows them to split that schedule within the day. And students can still do both of those, but it will be listed as two separate courses. Uh, the third one, or third set of uh, new courses, actually is a replacement of the AP Physics B course by the, uh, this is aligned with the College Board's testing program. Um, that course is being discontinued by the College Board and is being split into two courses, algebra, excuse me, AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2, which, is, uh, which are algebra-based uh, physics courses. And then the final uh, recommendation is a new program for HVAC certification in the CTE department. You may recall a couple years ago when we introduced plumbing as mm -hmm. a, a program coming back to the Forest Center, it was originally proposed as a plumbing HVAC program. However, the State Department in its certification process um, says that those need to be two separate courses. So plumbing is one set of courses, HVAC as another set of certifications. And so this allows us to have both of those as completer programs uh, within our offerings. So as a result of those new changes and the mm -hmm. AP uh, reconfiguration, as I talked about, uh, the College Board is discontinuing AP Physics B, and so we're discontinuing it as a course and replacing it again with the um, AP Physics 1 and 2. And now we bring about two new pathways for our students, um, as has been um, a longstanding effort to have uh, different pathways for students, different affinities, talents, and abilities. Uh, we're looking at two different pathways to add to these program offerings starting next year. The first is a case program, looking at a program in ag agricultural science. And uh, the superintendent did address this at the um, State of the Schools presentation. I always mentioned it several times before. But this really looks at uh, tapping into students' interest in the um, agricultural sciences. And the first course in that sequence uh, would be an agricultural food and natural resources course. Additional courses would be added as the program uh, continues, but this will be the first year in that course, and it would be housed at the Forest Center as well. The uh, second 
pathway is an academy for visual and performing arts. And so this uh, program would be a multifaceted program that would include uh, students in theater or chor chorus or uh, orchestra and band, as well as the introduction of dance as a pro series of programs uh, as well. And with that, we would introduce three new classes so that students could take these dance programs, uh, dance one and two, and then dance company one, which is a more collective piece. So uh, these would be necessary to, uh, to launch that Visual and Performing Arts Academy and would provide some, elect some programs for students as well. Again, this Academy of Visual and Performing Arts would be housed at Chopticon High School. And then uh, this next one is coming out of uh, student interest and teacher interest as well. There's been some discussion about a teacher academy as a certification program. Uh, this is a kind of a grow your own program for uh, high school students who are interested in becoming future teachers. And to gauge interest for that program, uh, we want to pilot a course in human growth and development through adolescence, which is the first course in the completer pathway for uh, that teacher academy program, which is an approved program by MSDE. Currently, we have a number of psychology courses that are offered at each of the high schools. Those are run as full schedules. Uh, this would um, potentially uh, be one of those sections of an ed psych uh, type of class to get students uh, to see who's interested in this, this educational program. Um, each of the high schools are willing to uh, pilot this as a course and see what student interest there is. If um, this does garner enough student interest, it might be something for us to consider uh, expanding the program for next year. The next one is not a set of new courses, but a change in sequence. As a result of the next generation science standards uh, that are now approved and moving forward, uh, we looked at the sequence of our science courses. Currently, we have concept-based physics as the core ninth grade course. With the realignment of the science standards, as well as the need to prepare students for the biology course and the biology assessment that is a 10th grade core course, this realigns that course sequence and pushes concept-based physics as, as a class that's available to 11th and 12th graders and makes the grade 9 CM course Earth and Space Science. Students who are accelerated uh, are still able to take biology honors as 9th graders, um, but this makes that core course the Earth Space Science. As a sort of cascading effect to that realignment of science courses, there's a number of science courses that we had to change prerequisite or grade level focus areas for each of these. Um, so uh, if, for example, concept-based physics was a prerequisite for a course, and now that's offered at 11th grade, 12th grade class, then it changed the prerequisites for many science courses. Um, and then uh, also the, the uh, grade changes that were uh, proposed for each one of these. We're also looking at um, in the description for CTEs, uh, in C under CTE, the business law course, putting that more as a focused 11th grade, 12th grade course rather than a 9 through 12 course, and that's by teacher recommendation. And then the final change in the descriptions is under world language, uh, changing the AP course to called Spanish language. It is essentially the same core course, but uh, the College Board changed the language uh, the title of the course uh, for the assessment, so that is being changed in our program of studies as well. Mm -hmm. And then finally, this is uh, a new piece. Before uh, the holiday break, uh, the Maryland State Board of Education passed a revised COMAR looking at the um, Senate Bill 740 that proposed uh, adding that fourth year of mathematics. We already have it as a requirement for students to take that fourth year of mathematics. When it became a statewide goal, they had to revise COMAR. When they did so, they put in this clause here that, uh, number one, uh, offer in public schools a mathematics program in grades 9 through 12. But what it also is, uh, provided for is looking at other courses that could satisfy that mathematics requirement. So you'll see that what they said is that the graduations uh, requirements 
those, that fourth year of math can be satisfied by selecting mathematics or mathematics related courses that might include a mathematics transition course, algebra two, pre-calculus, discrete mathematics, linear algebra, prob probability and statistics, and then additionally computer science, AP computer science, AP calculus, um, AB and BC. When we looked at our program of studies, then that affected three courses, foundations in computer science, computer science principles, and AP computer science A. Those three courses, uh, by way of this new regulation, would then meet that fourth year of mathematics. So uh, those are the recommendations that we bring forward for revising the program of studies for 2014-2015. Uh, our next steps are to bring forward a public hearing at the January 28th board meeting and for your recommendation uh, for approval at the February 12th meeting given any feedback uh, as we move forward. Board members, before he, we turn over, Jeff, can I ask you a real quick question, comment? Yes. This incorporates, I had to step out for a little bit, but we are aligning ourselves uh, with the expectations of the core standards and all of those yes. major adjustments to reflect that. Uh, if you emphasize that point when I was out, I apologize, yes, but we the, need to. The key point was with the realignment of the science uh, standards affecting the um, sequence of science courses. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, questions, comments? Mrs. Allen? I, um, I really like the thought that has gone into this. I especially like the Academy of Fine Arts for so long, we have stressed um, uh, sort of the, the, I won't even say the academic side of, for students, but um, I, I think we've stressed the various sciences um, and, uh, and global politics and, and finance, uh, but the piece that's really been missing to make this a, um, a total system that has offerings that appeal to um, a, a great range of students. Bringing in the Academy of Fine Arts um, uh, really steps this up um, a great deal. Um, I think that the courses that you've presented, um, I, I understand the only question I have is um, the, uh, the split on AP World History. Um, I see that in the course descriptions that you've provided for us um, that it indicates that this will be offered, that the intro to global and international studies is offered for grades 10 to 12, but it speaks to AP World History, which is a ninth grade class, correct? Yes. So help me understand, I, I got several different things from what was written <coughs> here as compared to what I understood Dr. Marr to say, which was that currently this is a double block um, and, and you are splitting this, but now it makes it sound as though the students will take AP World History in ninth grade, but they'll take this intro to global and international studies in 10th grade, did I, I'm missing something somewhere. Um, we need to go back and look at, that may have been just a, 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 an error in the grade level that were identified, we can go back and look. Okay, the, the, I'm, and, and I'm referring not to your PowerPoint, but rather to the, right. um, to the other document. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that would make more sense to me, because I, as I understood what you said, that AP World History is currently a double block, and what you're going to do is split that so that they would take one course period that's AP World History, right. and in the same year, in that ninth grade year, they would also take the intro to global, to, to GIS. Is that correct? That's correct. correct. Okay. That, that makes sense, because it, it okay. made it sound like we were going to help them to understand what it means to take an AP course but we were going to do it the year after they started their AP. Right, and we can go back and correct that grade level designation. Okay. Too, that AP World is generally offered as a course for um, upper grade students, and so that's right. where the overlap was. So we'll, we'll address that. Next. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That that helps me understand. Right. 
<clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mrs. Washington. Thank you for your hard work, and I endorse the new programs that are being implemented. But most importantly, I applaud the Potential Teacher Academy program, and this is an excellent way to grow our own future teachers and educators. Mm -hmm. Everyone starts with a teacher. And we have several pathways, but the major one, this one, was missing from the school system. It is one of the most important professions in the world, and that is to be a teacher. I am very pleased to see the, uh, that the interests of the students are being engaged, and this would complement our Future Educators of America program. Right. So I am well pleased that education system finally has, a, will have a teacher educator program. With more rollout in future right. years. Right. This is our first, so as I'm focusing in on CASE and on the Fine Arts Academy this year, uh, this is the preliminary pieces of the Teacher Academy. Uh, that's why I've not talked a great deal about it in public, but to get it moving in everything that you just said, Mrs. Washington, in alignment with the Future Teachers of America, there will be more discussion about this in subsequent years as well as we advance this. Now, so, good point. How will you gauge the students' interest? Well, as we come up to the later part of this spring and students are selecting courses for next year, um, again, this would be an option instead of, for example, taking uh, a psychology course that they might sign up for this as this ed psych class um, or adolescent growth and development class. And so um, based on student interest, uh, we'll determine uh, whether or not we're able to run a section at each of the schools. Um, but uh, it, will, it will be dependent on uh, student interest and availability of staff to teach it as well. And the concept right now is to promote it. As you know, all of our, our, our uh, pathway models uh, are based upon socializing it, providing information, recruiting, and doing all that. That's why we want to start a little earlier on this piece of it and uh, begin to tap individuals to, to take those courses as well. So, and we have to do all of those with all of our programs, uh, our academy, our flight academy, et cetera. So it just, just ties right in. May I piggyback on sure. that? Oh, yeah. um, I, and I would hope that we wouldn't just take one year, because it does take a little time right. to mm -hmm. kind of build that piece, um, is to make sure that um, we give this the, the trial that it, that it really needs yeah. to. Um, it's kind of like an incubation period. Well, yeah. it is. And, and I think, you know, as you're, as you're starting into high school and you're kind of, you've got your mindset of here's what I'm going to do, or if you're already into high school and you're thinking here's what I'm going to do, and I've kind of got my course schedule filled out for the four years and now suddenly presented with this. I don't want to derail anyone, yeah. but I also don't want to derail the opportunity right. to take the class. And, and like any other pilot course, we not only look at enrollment, but we also look at um, how students progress in the course and uh, the student feedback throughout the year as well. So all of those things will be taken into account as we, we look forward uh, to next year and the year after and, and moving the program from there. Thank you. Could you tell me some of the tidbits of the strategic plan to get students interested in this teacher educator program? Uh, following what do you do? Following the approval of, of any new courses, um, we meet with all of the counselors uh, in the, the coming months to go through all of the uh, approved courses. Um, each of the content uh, supervisors also meet with their department chairs. And then a lot of the I information that, that um, then comes to students is, is from the teachers too. And, and those conversations as students are looking for next year's classes and they start selecting the courses, uh, they're having conversations with their teachers and their counselors. And so uh, that's, that's uh, much of it. As well as um, when we move into uh, February and March and we do the sessions for rising ninth graders, uh, they receive the um, information about all the academies, the application process for the academies, as well as all of the new courses that are offered and the long list of electives and courses that they need as they go forward to um, through each year. So uh, it's, a, it's an involved process that really involves every, everybody at the, at the high school level and, and your eighth graders ri rising up. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Washington. Mr. Matthews. First off, I want to reach out and say thank you to everybody for all the countless hours it took to put this together. Um, I realize it's a lot of work, and my goodness, how exciting is this? We've got new pathways. I, reading through it, it looks like it, it should come out of a college program. Mm -hmm. yep, isn't um, that wonderful? Thank you for saying that. It's spectacular. It's exciting. Um, 
back in my day, I had very little selection. Right, right, right. <laughs> I took math and I took English. And, and, but this is exciting, this is great stuff, and good job. Thank but you. doesn't it also, Mr. Matthews, doesn't it dovetail with my comments at the beginning of the board meeting about the conversations with the college students who came back mm -hmm. Absolutely. in terms of preparation? Mm -hmm. So it was interesting that I didn't intentionally time it this way, that that conversation would occur at the same time or marry up that interaction in December to advance the, the program of studies. But that was a great dipstick for us to be able to tap in mm -hmm. and then advance the continued rigorous and make the adjustments accordingly, as well as any adjustments for the core standards curriculum implementation. Good point. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. And if I could also add, too, um, one of the things that students brought forward at that, um, that forum with the superintendent uh, was that uh, valuing the, the choices and the options that they had in high school also helped prepare them for colleges when they had right. to make those choices. So. Right. Thank you. Mrs. Scott. Well, I think the more um, choices we have, the better it is for the children, the, the students. And, um, well, I've said it before, but my granddaughter is ecstatic. She's in the STEM Academy, and then sooner, and she's going to stay in it. She loves it. She loves Dr. Martirano, too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, they're eventually, as you know, going to have a wing at Spring Ridge where they'll have their own place. Now, we're getting so many of these um, pathways. You almost think about, gee, we ought to have arches entering the Finance Academy, entering this, you know. But I'm just beginning to wonder, sitting here, how many children, uh, there's, there's still children, too many children. Anyway, we will have total in all these academies because I am, I don't like huge school, well, you can probably have a huge school with segments mm -hmm. like, say, Spring Ridge or anyone. But um, how many kids all together are we going to have yeah. involved in pathways versus our general? Well, we have over 10% of our students in exactly. pathway That's programs now. And with the expansion of the Fine Arts Academy as well as additional programs to um, the Forest Center, uh, makes that number grow even larger. So and, and point to that uh, vi visual right mm -hmm. there on the wall, Jeff, that has our, our goal that I advanced to the board was to have 10% of our student body involved in a career-based choice model. Now that's obviously going to continue to expand and we, we talked about the inclusion of ROTC, we talked about the inclusion of a variety of different factors. All of those are designed with a way to meet the interest of what that child is interested in to, defend, to find that uh, level of success in terms of interest. And then if you follow that chart as well, in the middle, that purple, light blue, periwinkle color, whatever mm -hmm. color you want to mm -hmm. call it, that if you're not in a pathway model, per se, mm -hmm. you are going through a comprehensive Scott High School mm -hmm. with a selection of a series of offerings of AP, ex ex et cetera, to advance a very rigorous program. I talk about my two children. Uh, my son did not participate in a pathway model, but got a very high quality education by going through the comprehensive high school. My daughter, who just graduated, went through the programs at the Forest Center in addition to the comprehensive and met those needs as far as able, being able to test out the medical profession in terms of an interest for her uh, at the Forest Center in Allied Health. So all of these are designed for that interest and I appreciate you bringing out that number but the other piece that I'm very cognizant about is I don't necessarily want to water it down. So the instructional supervisors have been given the clear direction to advance programs with a level of fidelity uh, they're going to meet the interest that we have the infrastructure and capacity to support it as well as then the budget supports it as well. The beautiful thing is this board has supported the heavy lift years ago when I advanced the STEM program to you. We had to re-examine, and Dr. Raska, uh, Raspa can attest to this, we had to re-examine our whole transportation model. We turned that upside down with a hub process with where students are being uh, picked up. But now the beautiful thing is the infrastructure support there Anytime we have these models that we advance, that system supports that. So do we have the funding? Do we have the transportation? Are we meeting the needs? And right now, we've, we've got students moving all through the school district. When you throw the charter school into the mix, you throw the four center into the mix, the pathway models, the two that we're advancing formally, CASE, and uh, the Academy of uh, the Fine Arts Academy, and then throwing the teacher piece of it, all of those are designed to keep the students' interest and to keep them in school and to also test out their career interest later and ultimately to be more successful. And the beautiful thing, again, was that that was 
further emphasized with the young people who are in college. Again, a small sample, but I'm extrapolating that out. So your point's well taken, and we'll give you the, once we go through the selection process this year, we will be in the recruitment process, I should say, uh, here in the next several months. Once we get all of that together, we will present you with a report of exactly what our numbers are and all those different programs. That's important to ask. Uh, I think it's wonderful. Uh, my son, Tommy, he's 43. I, I think, oh, God, I've got a 43 year <laughs> Anyway, and he went to Great Mills, uh -huh. but he needed to be challenged. So they sent him to La Plata to take uh, electronics, and he's an engineer. Yeah, right. But it wasn't here. Exactly. You know, and how many kids... Well, hopefully they came back and went to community college and got it, but we're really going yeah. above and beyond a lot of places. Well, and Mrs. Crosby, your comment is excellent because one of the things that uh, drives all of us, and as I thought about you know, my assimilation into this school district, was I didn't want our children to feel inferior to any other school system in America. So that by virtue of, if you're a student at St. Mary's County Public Schools, when you leave us and you go to a, a job or a college at another uh, area of the state or the nation, that when you're able to interact with the students who are coming in from different school systems, what's your level of competition? And we teased that question out. Uh, remember we said, how did you compare to your peers? And we heard over and over that they felt either equal or above in terms of competition and preparation amongst their peers because you know how you gauge yourself to each other. You're, you're, you're st sizing yourself up based upon ability. You know who the, the high flyers are. You know who the ones are when you're in college classes. That's self-selection process and we heard over and over. So what drives me is the fact that we want our children to feel because they've been a part of the St. Mary's County public school system when they're sitting in those classes with the Montgomery County kids and the Fairfax County kids and the kids from Ohio in colleges they're going to be the superstars. That's where we want them to be. So all of it's designed in that level. Your questions are excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Peter? I just want to actually add something else to say. But off of what, what Dr. Monrano said, in fact, with, for what I do for student government and with the Southern Maryland Association Student Councils, we go and we do a lot of activities at the state level going to things like our conventions, going to fall leadership conference. In fact, coming up, we have a legislative session. In fact, Mr. Wright, who's here today, he's our uh, supervisor for uh, Southern Mary's Association Councils. He is. And Excellent, too. When, when we go out and we go to these different councils, and even um, Maryland Leadership Workshops, which are in the summer, and you go and we talk and interact with people and students from other counties, and we talk about programs like these, and we we're almost surprised at how other counties don't have all these amazing programs and these amazing things in these academies, the Academy of Finance, and they, some counties don't have like things like the Ford Center. They don't have occupational study programs that they can go to. And that's when we kind of realize how fortunate we are to have these different programs. And that's talking as a student that's been going and talking to other students around the state and how lucky we are to actually have these programs. And, how thankful we should be for the people who support them, uh, that we do have them. And in regards to uh, the new courses and the course changes, speaking as a student who's gone through the process in this being my senior year, and knowing people who have gone through the Academy of Finance, being a student, I've gone, I go to the Four Center still, and I've graduated from the Four Center, and it is, great to have all these different programs and things we can go to. For example, the Academy of Finance that we have already at Shoptakan. I know a lot of people who, in fact, don't uh, play soccer with somebody. They actually wouldn't be going to St. Mary's County Public Schools if they weren't in the Academy of Finance. They'd be going to Charles County. Uh, they'd be going to Thomas Stone, I believe. So switching school districts to be able to come to one of our programs at St. Mary's County is it, it's a very big deal and it's something that should be uh, looked at. But there was just one thing. As long as that's a legitimate transfer. I think <laughs> 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 I there was a, law, a little pause there yeah. in my thought they process. Bought a house here too. I wanted to be the voice of uh, reason on that. That's why the deep voice. <laughs> exactly. Well, and there's just one one thing I wanted to say with the concept-based physics. I know myself, I took that class my freshman year, and it was 
a very challenging course. It was something that at first I didn't really get grades in it because it was a completely different course than anything I've ever taken going through middle school um, that far. And it was very challenging, not just to me, but to other to notice, like, other students in that class. But when I, I kind of noticed that, and looking back at it, it was kind of, I needed that as a freshman. Mm -hmm. And with that, pushing it, are we pushing it back up to, I believe, 11th, 12th, 11th, 11th 12th, 12th grade? grade course, yes. It doesn't have the same, I should say, effect that it would on a freshman taking that course. And so. uh, Mr. Hayes is here. He's the science supervisor and has also taught these classes as well as been an administrator um, scheduling for these classes too. The one thing I want to just add and then I'll, I'll let Mr. Hayes add some words as well mm -hmm. is that um, part of the resequencing of the courses is to look at the new standards for science. And this allows for a real progression of the skills as students go um, from their ninth grade year to their tenth, you know, particularly tenth grade with biology and having to pass the biology HSA, this really puts that solid foundation for that and then moves forward with being prepared for uh, other courses like chemistry in, in 11th grade, for example. So, uh, Mr. Hayes, I don't know if you want to add some words there. Too. Mr. Warbaugh, I understand what you're coming from. Um, I taught the class for three years when I was at Leonardtown High School and then for four years as an administrator, I worked with teachers that taught the class. Um, Unfortunately, the class, the way it, it has been designed, is that the original idea was that it was to run concurrently with students taking Algebra 1. Yeah. And what I've found historically was that students that struggle in Algebra 1 also struggle with this class. And, and getting back to what Dr. Monaro said about fidelity and, and good quality yeah. instruction, at this point, it's just, in my opinion, with the next gen standards, it's not a good viable option for freshmen, unfortunately. Um, and with physics too, that, that's a very abstract science class and a lot of students struggle with, with that, especially at the younger freshman levels. So to push it back to 11th, 12th grade and to give students two or three more years of science before they take physics is, is the hope with that. And pushing earth space back to ninth grade better aligns with the next gen standards which are very heavy in earth space science as they are in the physical science with concept based physics. And that's what, what I took in fact, when I did took physics, I took algebra one as well my mm -hmm. freshman year, mm -hmm. and it it I, I do see where where that's coming from because when I was in algebra one the class, sometimes my physics teacher and my algebra one teacher would have to coordinate because mm -hmm. they didn't know what all we knew at that time for doing specific formulas and learning how to do equations <laughs> and things like that. So that does make sense. But the main thing I was really trying to get across was the, not the kind of the the principle of challenge in incoming freshmen that knowing that the, the level of work is transitioning from this middle school level to a different high school level preparing and that's what really prepared a lot of people I know for AP courses knowing that 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 type of work isn't as it wasn't as rigorous as an AP class was but it was that step from maybe a I thought it was a little more than a CM class level maybe it could have been like an honors the, the level of work but just the kind of the principle of moving up in in that competitive level. And so. something I'd like to see in my tenure as science supervisor is I'd like to see more offerings for honors science classes, mm -hmm. one of which I thought of was a physics, an honors physics class, yeah. which we currently don't have. We have physics one, and then we have the AP physics mm -hmm. courses and concept based, but I would like to eventually see another honors offering to go along with what you just said. Thank you. And you think that's necessary, would be needed? Yes, and uh, mainly for me, for taking concept-based physics, it was a lot different than taking an AP because a lot of students, you, you choose to take an AP, and then for like the CM concept-based physics, it's kind of like, a, it was more of a standard class. But I know the curriculum has changed from my freshman year to now, for example, my freshman year, you didn't have to have four years of math to graduate. So you could, you could take, in fact, if you could be in, sophomore year and not take a math junior or senior year if your schedule had worked out that way. And it's a lot different now Correct. with what with what we have and what the actual state <laughs> law is with having to, it, I know it changed from four years to if you complete algebra two, which right. is a diff, completely different story. So uh, that, that's what I really wanted to Good mention. If, if I might 
it does um, <clears throat> spark a thought in mind. Um, I've heard from a, a lot of different students, which, and I would say to the superintendent that perhaps for some time in the future, um, I would be really interested in hearing um, a bit of a presentation or some understanding of what we as a school system are doing in our high schools to really draw that line clearly for students to help them understand um, what it's going to take to be successful in high school classes as well as college or, or whatever they do following high school. Um, I think a lot of times we, we assume that students understand you're going to have to work harder here, um, but we don't make, I'm not sure we make the connection clearly enough um, for mm -hmm. them. And, and yet I know that we as a system are doing things to, to um, layer courses so that they're pre each level prepares them for the next. Um, but it's the, um, some of the things that Peter talked about earlier today in terms of um, flow mentoring and some of what he's gotten from that. Um, a lot of that I think also needs to be um, embedded in all that we're doing and um, and I suspect in some ways it is but I'd like to understand better exactly how that happens and and maybe just kind of take a self-reflection mm -hmm. examination as to um, are we doing what we think we're doing and are we clearly making the connection because we think we are but is it coming across on the other side so I, I would ask that okay yep. okay Thank you yep. thanks <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, great news, obviously, on adding the visual and performing arts. We've talked about that for a period of time, and we're finally getting there, and that's great. Parents will love that, and students also will love that situation. Uh, agricultural sciences, uh, great news again. Uh, and of course the uh, teacher academy program uh, that's very interesting it, it, it will be interesting to see how many students really sign up for that and get into that program uh, hmm? okay uh, thank you very very much and uh, we will proceed uh, and uh, the second reading will be at the, what, the next meeting, and then uh, the final action will be, what, the third meeting after this. Right. Dr. Marr, thank you very much. Nice job, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Norris. Yes, you stay. FY2104. <laughs> you don't have to leave. <laughs> uh, so just December out. financial report, sir. Okay, just a couple things to point out. On the revenue side, we've added a new line down here called textbook fines. Uh, what I discovered was that we were getting the money in, but it was just going in as miscellaneous revenue and what we really want to be doing. There's two fines at the schools. There's library media, which stays at the library in the school and they able to replace things, but there's also the textbooks. And so what we want to track this, so this goes back to Jeff Marr for buying additional textbooks and not just simply thrown in as additional miscellaneous revenue. So we've added that line and we will keep that line from now on. And then the other thing is we have been notified for our impact aid down here that the first check is coming. It is, I believe, $1,070,000, which is 50% of our FY 2014 allocation. But as you know, they just got finished closing out 2009. And so we will get other kinds of monies. We never get the full year's worth, but it looks like we're at least on track for that, too. So with sequestration, in all of that, the uh, check's in the mail. So we're doing that. <laughs> uh, again, we have the notes in here, so I don't need to go over too much in terms of some of the uh, highlighted bullets. But here, contract services. 
Uh, that's simply some additional monies for contract the temp agency and some of our, that all of our copiers are in there in our, uh, I forget which one we bought, but, but we've got the lease program in here for the copier program, so I just forget the detail there. Well, that'll be taken care of down here under special education contract and services. That is the contract with therapists. Uh, when Dr. Monterano goes through the presentation for 2015, this is covered in the FY15 budget. Uh, so we'll have this one year of being able to try to make that up. And then down here, this $250 for uh, student personnel services that's typically for evaluations. And then finally down here on the health, under salary and wages, you do know that what we are doing as LPNs, as we lose LPNs, we can't get any more LPNs, so we're making them RNs, and so this is the replacement of two LPN positions with RNs, so when we do the May categorical, we'll cover that. There's also two in the FY 2015 budget for anticipated movement of two LPNs to RNs for, for health services, so that's what that is. Uh, for student transportation, you see $6,000. This is for a uh, bus. We were able to get a 2001 bus to just <coughs> add to our fleet as a uh, backup. And so we were able to get one for 6000 We try to take advantage of those deals when we can so that we have a reserve fleet. Um, the money's down here and other charges for, oh, I'm sorry, Equipment up here under operations, that's to replace the box truck. That was bad, we'll cover that again. There will be, uh, there's always money left over in operations, so we'll be able to cover that <laughs> within the category. <laughs> well, and, and part of it, it's not to say a bad thing, but they have so much turnover in right. terms of positions and people and you know doing those kinds of things that it's not a bad thing, but operations just has that, mm -hmm. that um, thing over here. So down on maintenance, again, that has to do with the Spring Ridge. That'll be covered by the monies from the, uh, the insurance. And I believe I've covered everything. So we're doing good. Um, we'll be getting through the year. And as we work through some of the issues where you see that we have some of the overages, uh, for the most part, they've been covered as part of our FY15 uh, budget actions, hopefully, when you get ready to approve your budget on uh, February 28th, or 26th, excuse me. And other than that, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Okay, Mr. Norris, uh, <coughs> comments or questions for uh, Mr. Norris? Peter? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Crosby? No, thank okay. you. Mr. Matthews? Good job, sir, thank you. Mrs. Washington? No questions, thank you. Mrs. Allen? No questions, and again, thank you for the the information that you're putting in. It really is very, very helpful, both as I read it and as I go back and look at things. It's helpful so, for both of us. Dr. Monroe? No, I'm, I'm fine. Everything's excellent. Uh, just where are we with the disbursement of our OPEB payments? Where are we with that? Uh, we haven't dispersed any OPEB payment yet. We have to disperse our payment before we can get monies back from the county. So exactly. probably because of the cash flow issue with the three pays in November, right, right. And then, and then the short month in December, we'll probably towards the end of January be making our uh, OPEB payment. So what's on the books currently is about 20, uh, 28 million, somewhere Almost in there. Almost 28 million dollars. That and you does have, not include that, that disbursement for this particular right, time frame. And you have about 5 million because remember as part right, of the take us well over BOCC uh, actions, any money that was left over in health care also needed to be added to OPEB, and that is $90,900. So your OPEB payment this year is just over $5 million. Right, right. Okay, good. Okay. That's the only comment that I had. Okay, thank you. Okay, future board meeting. The next regular board meeting will be on Tuesday, I repeat, Tuesday, January the 28th, 2014, uh, at 5.30 p.m., uh, it is now approaching 1.15. The board will take a break and, and uh, will re-adjourn at 2 o'clock to continue with the work session. Re-adjourn. Re-convene. Hmm? That's nothing. Okay. Re-convene. This, what did I say? Re-adjourn. Oh, well, reconvene, excuse me, I've That's been corrected. <laughs> Mr. Smith, get the dictionary out. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this meeting is adjourned.